Okay, so good evening and welcome to the General Council uh, of June 27th. Uh, first, I would like to begin by identifying any media on the line. I don't see any media present at time. So that'll lead us into the adoption of the uh, agenda. Is there any additions or deletions to the agenda? And if not, looking to a mover and seconder to adopt our agenda for this evening. Um, uh, moved by Michelle, seconded by Greg. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing a motion is carried. Delegations for this evening's agenda. Just want to confirm, uh, sorry, uh, Brooke, did you say Jacqueline was in the chambers? Okay, so it looks like our delegation is getting set up. So just bear with us as we're getting uh, the delegation set up. The first uh, delegation uh, this evening is Jacqueline uh, House. Uh, again, it's on a building uh, bridges uh, discussion. Uh, she uh, wanted to be added to the agenda. So uh, that's our first delegation. Uh, and then we'll get into our second one, uh, which is the application for a wedding officiant, uh, Jamie Montour, and as well as a presentation uh, from Bonnie Whitlow and Cheryl Hancock for Disc Golf which is a course, uh, disc golf course project. And then finally finishing off delegation portion uh, with Grant Bruno from an ethic application. Uh, so that being said, uh, good evening and welcome to uh, General Council, Jacqueline. I'll, uh, I'll pass the floor uh, over to yourself. Can you hear me here? Okay. Is that what he wants me to do, start talking? Oh yeah, you can, you can begin your presentation now, uh, Jacqueline, and just FYI, we are live uh, oh. as well. All right. Okay. Um, okay, good evening. Today's June 27th, 2023. Back in January of this year, I did a presentation regarding McClung Road. Throughout that presentation, I asked if I had a voice even if I didn't vote. This council answered yes. There's many things I would like to bring to your attention, but I'm not, I'm going to try to stay focused as to why I asked to be put on the agenda with my immediate concern being this upcoming court case against Canada and how I feel about it. If I were a person looking in on Six Nations community as a whole, I would be very disheartened we talk about sovereignty and we talk about Six Nations as a whole. But in reality, Six Nations is a word that has caused so much division and it started with the Haldeman Tract. When I study our background, I understand the many reasons why we are so divided. Sure, it started with the colonial mindset to integrate us to be just like them, but we are not. We are unique people and what makes us unique is the way the creator brought us into the world, which makes us special with that responsibility and instructions to the land. Being stewardesses to Turtle Island, we are the hosts. But because Canada intervened in our canoe, we lost sight of it. And that, lo and that loss of starts right here with the elected band council. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm certain this part of the original instructions is not what band count is not with the <clears throat> with band council. We are Haudenosaunee first and foremost, and I don't know what that means to you, but to me it comes with a lot of responsibility to each other, to the outside, our forefathers, and most importantly to the Creator. I hear a lot of stories pertaining to worth that work ethics here the elected band council and how gag orders are at the forefront. Now they may be rumors, 
But like anything else, there is some truth to those stories. And that's what saddens me. One thing that is un unsettling to me as well is that is in January, you asked a very big request of me, how bridge the Confederacy with the elected band council. I'm here to say I cannot do that for it is not my responsibility. The other thing you asked of me is to help put a, uh, a healing gathering. And I think that you've um, done so already, but I am also here to answer that as well. And I can't do that either. I am not a person who carries or holds them kinds of power. So for me, healing for me, healing is a very part, a very big part of self-reflecting. In order to move forward, this is important. So, so let's look at 1924. How did that come about? Again, there are many tales as to how this transpired, but more importantly, why? I'm not trying to be rude nor ignorant, nor do I nor do I want to come across this way. But my reality is oppression, the acts of genocide, and silent annihilation in a form of politics. The fear of extinction is real. Our treaties are not historical, they remain in effect. So my big question is: where did the treaty relationships lie with, band, with, with the elected band council? or the Confederacy? And to me, that is a very big question of today, especially with this, um, this court case that's coming up. Um, when I look in the papers, I'm very, very, very um, hurt, very saddened about what I'm reading. And, and, it's, and, it's, and, it's, and it's made public. All this stuff is made public. And to me, it doesn't look very good on all of us. It's not one, it's not one or the other, it's all of us and how we can't come together. And this is exactly what Canada wants, is division. Now I want, I want to know who represents me in all of this. I don't vote. I'm not part of that Canadian system. Yes, sure. I know everybody always argues and say, well, you got a birth certificate and you got a status card and you got a license. Yes, I do. But that birth certificate was given to me by my mother. The status card was given to me by my mother. And in order to get around, I had to get license. So we can always go back to that because I hear that a lot. Well, you got this and you got that. But you know what? The reality of it is we were part of that colonial system and we still are. So how do we get away from that? How do we get away from that when we see how much of Indian Northern Affairs has their foot in our, in our door? In our canoe. In our canoe. And they're not just sitting there in our canoe. They are actually steering it. And we're all allowing it. We're all allowing this to happen. I look at the status cards and I see um, Indian Northern Affairs. They are um, a very big part of wanting to decide who's got quantum and who doesn't. And let's talk about that because I went to the United Nations back in uh, 2012, I think, or some, I can't remember the, quite the year. But I remember going up there and lobbying against Canada. And I remember sitting at the Canadian embassy and I remember talking about those status cards and how when I was born, how I have Onondaga Clear Sky on mine, yet my mom is Cayuga Turtle and my father is Cayuga Wolf. And I had to do my own research. So my father was born a, a, Cayuga, Tur a Cayuga Wolf. When he was nine years old, he was adopted by this man named Austin House. And whether Austin was on a dog or not, I'm not sure. So when, when Florence, my grandmother married Austin, they put my father under on a dog. When my father later on in years married uh, my mother, they put my mother on on a dog. And when my mom had kids, we went on Onondaga. And when I, when I spoke of this at the United Nations level, I said, 
that is genocide. And not only genocide, but you have us committing fraud. When I go into Walmart and I sign a status card that says, that's me, who I am, on a dollar clear sky, that's a lie. I'm Cayuga. I'm a Cayuga turtle, just like my mother. So when we talk about sovereignty and we talk about who's right and who's wrong, we all have something to blame on. When, because that's the way I was born and raised. When you look for blame, you have to find blame within. And that's why I'm here today. I don't want to be a part of that blame anymore. I want to be a part of solving our problems. I want to be a part of helping us solve our problems. Because all we're doing is rolling the big snowball up a hill and collecting more garbage and more garbage along the way. And when we get to when are we ever going to get to the top? And how is that going to come down? It's going to come crashing down on all of us. And what and then what? We're all going to be integrated into Canadian society and, 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 and labeled as a Canadian citizen. If we don't start by looking and doing reality checks, the treaty is a re, the, the treaties are put here by our forefathers who were brilliant, very, very, very brilliant people. This is why we have survived. This is why we continue to survive as a people. So when I look at this court case, yes, I'm very disturbed about it because you can go in there all you want and talk about anything you want, but by the end of the day, that treaty relationship is the signif most significant thing on the outcome of it. And you can trump your own trump because Canada can use that against you. So I wanna know where I stand when it comes to this court case because nobody asked me how I feel about it. And I see so much going on. Like, and, I, and I come to this council, I've come to this council through respect. And I've come here and I've talked about my land grievances with my family, that land grievance is still here today. My family is more divided than ever. And not only that, I see several other families divided through that because of the Indian in Northern Affairs has their foot in our door. And, and you can't say that Six Nations elected band council is not a part of it because when I look at my mom's papers, I see the minutes from the elected band council. I see minutes from the lands and membership passing those minutes. And then when I come here, every, Ava says, everything was all okay. No, it's not. No, it's not okay. It is not okay because my family is still suffering and I see other families still suffering because of it. It's the same thing. Indian Northern Affairs picks and chooses when, how, and why they're gonna do what they wanna do. I just had a family come to me a couple years ago. The husband died and it was only a girlfriend. She had, he had four children. And the girl walks in, they were separated. She walks into uh, to the Indian Northern Affairs and she says, I'm the only living heir. And band council hands her a 200 year homestead. Just like that, just like that. So what does it mean to this family? This family is pushed out. These are the things that I'm talking about. I see these things and I'm reading these things and I'm living it with my own family. Now, if you guys sat back and you, when I brought my grievances here before, you guys should have studied this because you know what? It's plain hindsight. My, my, my grandma, Sarah, gave my mom a half an acre of land. My grandma, Florence, gave my, my mom and dad, when they got married, an acre of land. That acre and a half of land should have become, that should have become whole as one. My mom and, the, and, and where, where they built, they built on a half, that part of that half an acre of land. So when my dad died, the house was too big. My mom, she um, took, out a, took out a loan. And when you take out a loan through your, through your office, it says you have to hand over an acre of land in collateral. Am I right or am I wrong? Because that's the things that I'm reading. So when we were growing up, there was a half an acre left beside my, my Uncle Sam's. And all of us kids knew that. My mom said, 
so when my my mom she she had my mom was partially blind when she lost my dad she was never the same and she and she trusted that was a big thing she trusted not only my oldest sister but this community so when she when so when uh, she borrowed money off my oldest sister my oldest sister turned around and says well ma you don't have to pay me back why don't you just give me the half an acre of land so my mom says yeah okay well guess what the half an acre of land became the half an acre where her house sat on now how did that slip by anybody when that land should have been in collateral and so and and my oldest sister she should have done a survey because bill mentor can't told me that he when i come when i come to talking to him behind in, in his office that's what he said the things that the first thing that should have been done was a survey and if that wasn't done it was illegal so later and my mom never knew this all these years so later on she pays the, she pays the loan back and later on not even in, in 2000 she got another loan to renovate her house a house that she never even owned because it doesn't there was never an existing house on the acre of land that was left so how can that be okay how can that be okay so my mom had two loans on a house that she never even owned basically she had to pay back so how tell me how did that slip through and tell me how does that how does that sound right so my family is fighting. My family has never been the same because my oldest sister said, well, that's mine, fair and square. Then he turned around, we got a judge, we went to court, we got everything. The judge, the judge um, with his raised stamp, my sister moved in through the, through, through the deal that we made. And my other sister comes waltzing in there, says, well, I'll be the administrator, blah, 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 we'll get this done. Because you know what? My hands were at a crossroad. When my older sister went to court, when we all went to court, we all agreed. And she agreed that she would put my other sister on that deed with her. And she never did. She never put that, that, uh, um, that her name on that deed with her. So I could have took her back to court and I could have held her in contempt. Yes, I could have. Do you think I wanted to do that to my sister? No. So I left it, I left it hanging. Then come along my other sister, she's, 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 um, comes along and she gets in there, she gets involved. She wants to be an administrator because she wants to settle this. She gets involved. Next thing you know, everything, all the hard work that I did to make sure that every one of us was included in that, in that, in that, in that estate was null and void. Two days later, my sister's daughter goes and hands my sister an eviction notice. So you guys tell me, tell me how that makes everything all right. And this is what's happening to a lot of families here on Six Nations. It ain't just mine. There's like four or five people that come to me with their hands tied. Their, their family estate, 200 year, 200 year family estate gone just like that and the kids are left with nothing four kids left with nothing so i look at these court cases and i'm like okay well if you guys can take canada court how come you can't fix all these things that have been done to us in our own backyard why are why am i being ignored it was not my problem it wasn't created by me and I got to fix it. And I did only to be left as a black sheep. So yeah, there is a lot of things that I got to say. And I see a lot, I hear about gag orders. I hear about people saying they can't speak because they work for band council. That's another thing that disheartens me. Why, do, where's our, why, where's our freedom? Where's our voice? Where's our voices? And that was the first question I asked back in January. Do I have a voice? Do I have a voice? And I was told, yes, I do. 
But what's happening with the people that work here? Where's their voices? Why can't they, if they see a land claim going on, why can't they pick up and go, go stand on that land claim and fight for our rights without repercussions? So that's, that, that's, that's is what, and I said that this year, I said that in the beginning. My mom says, go up there, see what's going on with band council because they're chipping away our rights. And that's why I'm, I'm gonna keep coming back and I'm gonna keep coming back because something has to be done. Something, somebody has to wake up to these atrocities that are happening to our people in our own backyards. In our own backyards. Look at the bullying that's going on. Look at the drugs that's going on in this community. It's sad. It's sad and it's overwhelming. I know we rent, we rent um, property units and I, I deal with that. I deal with all that kind of stuff. So I do know what firsthand, what is happening within our community and how hard it is for me to turn around and to walk away and say, oh, wow, that's your problem. No, it's not. It's all of our problems. It's every one of our problems. And like I said, back in January, we should be ashamed. When that baby died, when that baby died, that got into drugs and we didn't do nothing, none of us, even me, we all should be ashamed of ourselves because that's what we talk about. Those faces yet to be born, the next generations, the seven generations to come. That's what our kids have to look forward to is being raised in a drug house, being raised surrounded by drugs. Now, I know my oldest grandson, he's going to grade eight or grade nine this uh, come September. I'm afraid for him. I'm afraid what he's going to encounter, what he's going to come up to. So I'm not here out of anger. I'm not here to push your backs against the wall. I'm here because I have valid reasons and valid concerns. And I have a voice. And I have my children, my grandchildren that are being raised in this community as well. I've always respected this. I've, I've always shown my respect when it came to you guys. Always. Because I look at you as part of this community. I take that title off of you and say, okay, where, where, where do you come from? You come from the same place I do, the same background as I do. Now I know that you guys have this job and I know that you have this administration building, but I also know that Canada plays a very big part in it. And we talk about this stuff all the time. We talk about those missing, those missing children. We talk about all this stuff, but we're not doing anything about it. All we're doing is now we're fighting over, over who's gonna be in the court and who's not. And that, again, is really disgusting. And in two old times, they're picking that up like crazy. They're just running with that story. And I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like seeing us smeared all over newspapers, how divided we are. My kids, it affects my kids. So I know, like, I know how I was raised. I know how I was raised. So I'm not, I'm not I'm, I'm, when I came in here in January, I come in here and I talked about McClung Road and I, and I don't see anybody grabbing onto it. Let's sit down, Jacqueline, let's sit down and talk about this. Because when I, got, I got people working from Nova Scotia, environmentalists, isn't it? And they're saying that there should be another environmental study down there. They're talking about there should be, um, there's stuff that's going on in McClung Road that, sh that was overlooked and that should never been overlooked. And you, you guys have the resources. I don't. And I'm relying on outside help, volunteer help. I can't even offer them a dime for their services. So I, I'm, I, I can't let McClung Road because I don't know, something inside of me is not settled and not happy. And I don't know about you guys, how you guys can sleep at night or how you guys can go on and knowing that 
our lands are being further encroached upon and we are suffering. Our people are suffering. We don't even have any places to live. That's why we're fighting over each other, our, 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 our homesteads. We're all fighting with each other. Our families are getting ripped apart because of it, because there's no additional land. Everybody around us is, is living high off the hog while we are suffering. And I want to know what you are doing about it. I want to know what's being done about it. Look at the guys on land back. Has anybody, has anybody went down there, reached out to them, asked them if they needed anything? Those guys are the real heroes here. They're the ones that are standing up every day, every day having to live through all that, all that mess that was created by the Canadian government. You we should be applauding these guys that are standing up there instead of putting them down. So I just want to know when it comes to that treaty relationship, where does it stand? It's not about six nations of the Grand River. It's about Haudenosaunee as a whole, because that's who we are. We're born Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse, every one of us. We're not born as a Cougar or, a, uh, or uh, on a dog. Those things were given to us by that outside world again. Labels separating us. Okay, Cougars over here, on the dog is over there, six, Seneca's over there, and Oneida's over there. But in reality, we're one. One heart, one mind, one voice. One and a shoney. So I want to know more about this court case. I want to know more, and I think I have a right to know more about it because I am a community member. And I want my voice heard. If I decide that HDI is the one that's going to get my voice heard, why is that wrong? Why is it wrong? Okay. So I like to say Nyawa, thank you for listening to me. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Okay, Nyawa, uh, Jacqueline, for, for coming in okay. uh, this evening. Uh, Nyawa, Jacqueline, for coming in this evening. It may be a little bit tough uh, to hear, but uh, I know, again, you've touched on a lot of issues. Um, and I think it's something where, um, you know, there's, I, you know, can't just give direct, oh, sorry, can't just give direct, uh, you know, answer to, or at, actually we can, Give direct answer to each of the issues you brought up um but i wanted to just touch on the last item that you talked about which was the court case i mean at the end of the day it's this has been something that has been in the works for the past 28 years and this is something that it was based upon at that time community wanting to do something and that is when we received from my research the direction to do that which was to have uh canada and ontario be accountable in which the whole purpose of the court case is the accounting of the lands and i think that's something where you know we've been lo looking at multiple ways of communication to get people involved we even had uh if you recall uh you know wanting to take buses with us to join us in the courts of community members. You know, there's, there's, there, there's not much, I guess, in a sense, interest or people f getting thoroughly engaged. And we've, we've built out a website, sngrlitigation.com. It has all the documents, it has everything that you could want to even know and learn about the court case itself. That's one avenue. There's obviously uh, our lands and resources. I know, uh, Jacqueline, you've submitted uh, questions at one point that was uh, uh, that was responsed or given a response from our, our director of lands and resources, Lonnie Bombery. I know, like, so it's it's a matter of, I think, just this, what you're doing, having these open, frank conversations. And really, how do we build out the pathway of healing as one? That's what it's really about, in my view. Um, and I think that's something 
that we all have to do. You're right, as a community, because we are divided. And if you also recall, it's the same tactics that the government uses, which you've already alluded to. It's, it's that divide and conquer. We know it's happening. We let it happen at times. But we also could be that bridge to fix it. And that's something that I think for this council has always tried to extend the rafters of what it looks like of the relationship with the Confederacy. You know, I, I, that's something that I, I, I remember at one point when I was on the youth council and just part of it, being a young person, I had a number of other young people with me and be a part of words that I went and got on the agenda at the Confederacy Council. In fact, I still have those same remarks and I, I, I'll, I'll be glad to share them with you uh, again, uh, Jackie, be, because at that time, it's, it was the same thing, uh, what you're saying now. Uh, and also did that same remarks to the council. So it's not like, a, you know, obviously it was, uh, you know, I guess at times seen with uh, another hat on per se, but the point was our people were suffering at that time and we still are, they still are suffering. And the, so that's part, I think, of what we have to do is this continue these conversations, continue these very open, frank conversations. Because you're right, everybody has a voice, regardless if you vote or not. Everybody has a voice. Now, how do we make sure that everybody's voices are being heard? Not just, again, the loudest voices or not just the ones who think that they know everything. We need to hear from the silent majority. That's always been the challenge. How do we wake up the silent majority? Because it's not just gonna take you and I, it's gotta take everyone. So that's something, some a, a little bit of, of, of my remarks. I'm entirely glad to see you here. Again, I'm t entirely glad to hear what you're bringing up. I want to see how we can, you know, like I, like you said, bridge. What's that healing path look like? I mean, I want to be part of the solutions too. I don't want to be part of the problem. So I, 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 I thank you, Senyawa, for coming back again because you're right. It's time to get on the ceiling path and we've got to do it together. Michelle? Okay, before we um, start, I, I, I turn my cameras because I, uh, well, first we want to hear, but Jackie actually brought a guest with her. So I was just wanting her to introduce so we knew. Um, I would like to introduce Jim. We're acquainted through uh, um, like joint uh, uh, through a group meetings and trying to um, I shouldn't say try try to not to use the word try but we are um, looking at trying to look at solutions to our problems and a big part of it is what is the difference between the people in a boat and the people in a canoe and that's how we that's how our group has been laid out on the foundation of the two row wampum because that relationship has to be restored as well and there and there is a relationship and there is differences there is differences in customs and laws and culture between the boat and and the canoe and i think that's a big part of maybe the selected band council should look at it through education. What does it mean? What does that two row wampum really mean? What does it look like? What does it entail? And why is it so significant to our survival? That might be a big step. Not just using it because it's there, but really understanding it, understanding what that two row wampum, because that's what we do. We talk about that two row wampum and the relationship and the respect how how we're supposed to um, conduct ourselves when there's issues that go on within the boat, they deal with that, they handle that. And when there's these issues that go on within our canoe, within our group setting, that 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 stuff relies in on a canoe. So there's a big understanding, like in an understanding of what that two row wampum really relationship really looks like for us. 
for us. And we just, we're just a small group. Now, if we can extend that and we can start learning and understanding ourselves here on Six Nations, we might get somewhere. We might very well get somewhere to understand what that two row wampum really signif signifies and why it was here and why we exist today. Because whether you're Six Nations like the Bank Council, whether you're somebody that runs is, is, a, is running a cigarette factory or a cannabis industry. There's a sovereignty that's going on. And why? Why do we have those special things in place? What makes us unique? And that's the question. What makes us unique? What makes us able to go and block a road off? Does anybody ever try to sit back and under, try to understand those significant things? Because I have, there's something there. There's, there's, there's something of a more of an understanding that we have to find. And, you know, we talk about, you want to talk about history and history and how everything come about. You look at all the stuff that happened to us in the past, whether it's residential school, you talk about education. Let's talk about education because that was a big, very big part of residential school. Let's educate the natives there's, to civilize them. And that, and, and, that, and that ideology was to say that we're uncivilized and we need the education to go into the education to make us civilized. Well, guess what's happening now? The people in the, in the boat is coming to the people in the canoe for education. Education on what does these what does these treaties mean? What does it signify? Signify, and where do we go and how do we do it? We have a lot a lot of allies out there that want to understand us, that want to get to know us, and I'm and I'm very appreciative that Jim and uh, the few of them that come to Six Nations that are actually coming to Six Nations to a meeting, to a meeting to talk about politics. Now that's that that took a lot to get to get to that. So those are the things that we talk about, and and I think that's a big that's what's lacking is our own education, trying to understand ourselves, trying to understand why we are able to do what we are able to do, and what signifies us, and what makes us unique. Because I know I know we are unique, and it's not just a word; it's not just a made up word. Our forefathers were very strategic people. They were so brilliant that they come up with wampums to signify to, 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 for that trade, for all that peace, trade, and commerce. But we lost sight since 1924. We have lost sight of what we are and who we are. And we become something the Canadian government wants us on that, on that string. So when they say jump, we say how high. Now, I know how this world works. I know how it works today, money. And that's what, and I, and I see that today, strive, everybody's striving, striving for money, power and control. And education, that's just a word. They used to be able to go up and they, they all um, our guys used to be skywalkers, right? They, 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 they were known as skywalkers. They never had education. Now, everybody says you got to get grade 12, you got to do this and that. Social service work, that was in our backyard. We vented. Or when the husbands went to work, the two ladies got together, got the kids together, kids played outside, women sat down and talked about what was going on. Now we need social service, we need, we need a degree in this, and we need a degree in that, and we need this and that, but you know what? We had it all. We had it all. We know how to can, we know how to sew, we know how to do all that stuff, we know how to fix our own problems, we know how to put medication to our kids' wounds. We were everything, the women. Today, we rely on the Western world to fix our problems. So where is the sovereignty? Where's the Haudenosaunee? Where is the word Haudenosaunee? Now we're just a group of people that make up Six Nations. So 
I know I hear Mark. I, I hear Mark when he's, he's I, I know that you're very um, apologetic and I know that you're very understanding and I know that you come from a good place. But I still don't feel settled with McClung Road. And the, mo and the reason, the most important reason why I don't feel settled is because I think it's just not fair. When I have to drive by McClung Road and I see these multi-million dollar houses going up and all these people coming in at Canada's letting in, take over and ousting us, how does that make it fair? How does it make it fair? So to me, it's the old saying, you need to zoom or get off the path. There's a big mess and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And pretty soon we will be absorbed into that Canadian politics and we will be a part of the Canadian citizenship. And that's what Canada wants. And that's what they use this, this administration to do exactly that, to do exactly that. Okay, so, I just, sorry, if I could just interject really quickly, uh, Jacqueline, uh, that's where I think I get a little, um, I guess, frustrated in a sense because, yes, okay, the Canadian government. You could talk about the the imposition of this this elected system. We could talk about all that, but we don't talk about why. Why did it happen? You know, and I don't want to go back and forth on the history, but at that time, from what I was told in 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 my le learnings, is that our people were suffering then, and we're we're out starving, cold. Well, there was other people who were still not suffering, had their own families taken care of. So there's a lot of things I think that we all don't know because I wasn't there in 1924. We can only read about what we what we think we know, but there's so many versions. That has always been my problem. What what version of our history is the right version? Because everybody seems to have different interpretations. But at the end of the day, I'm not sitting in this chair, and I know all of our counselors are not sitting in the chairs to further eliminate our rights. If anything, we are further fighting for them. There are absolute ways that we have to figure out. It's like a game of chess. Every move is strategic and has to be strategic. Whether we're working from the inside out and what that looks like, I think that's part of strategy. We have to be able to play the game and beat them at their game and do it better so that we can make sure that our, our rights continue to be there. And that's something, if you notice what's happening right now, we've been opposed to the Métis legislation. That's the most recent. There's legislation that they push down our throats left and right, and yet we don't even have time to keep up or catch up. There's so much happening right now that the government is trying to do, and we're not agreeing with that. We never have. In fact, that gives us more passion and more flame in our fires to keep going and to keep fighting for our right. I know sure, surely that we're not all sitting here to become uh, a municipality. I know that's always been a topic of discussion. We are not a municipality. We will never be a municipality. You've said it earlier of the uniqueness, but I'd rather at this point in time get into conversations around what are the suggestions of practical steps that we can make together, collectively? What are those types of suggestions that you can even give us and that we can have discussions as a community on where do we go from this point? We can sit here and talk and talk and talk and talk, but that's not going to do us any good either. We need to have practical steps of what it looks like to actionize what we're saying. And that's something that I want to be a part of. I see a couple of hands being raised. I'll first go over to Greg and then Hazel. Greg, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Jackie, I'm so sir. sorry, Michelle. I'll get back to you, Michelle. I apologize. Sorry, Greg, we'll go with you first and I'll get back to Michelle. Sorry. You know, your, your words are not falling on deaf ears. They're not. Um, as the chief said, we challenge, we challenge it every opportunity we can challenge. 
yes, they push things at us. They push things down our throat. They're trying to change our name to indigenous, trying to include other groups. And we push back, we push back. They are such a huge, huge organization that's dedicated to minimizing us, minimizing us. I've been to meetings. I've been to collective meetings where we're at the Chiefs of Ontario, we're at the, we're at the Assembly of First Nations, and that the barrage of the tactics that they use, like you said, to separate us, to make us fight amongst ourselves, to keep us in poverty, funding and treaty rights we, we're constantly battling with. And I've said this many times that collectively we have more power. Collectively we have more power. Sure, we have disagreements. The Haudenosaunee way, the Longhouse way, where we had 40 families, they all their voices were heard and then decisions were made. Now we have fraction groups. Groups are fraction. Families are broken up. But just as you said, a lot of these ideas come from sitting around kitchen tables, sitting around the fire, talking bringing those ideas forward collectively. And that, that's hard, that's hard. It's, it's hard for us to, to collect as one if we do have different, different opinions, but we listen. Our governance here is from the bottom up. White man, he's got the, he's got the president, he's got the prime minister. They just flow down. We listen across our whole land. We listen to everyone. We formulate those ideas. Then we take it, we challenge. I've, I've done that. They've tried to force down healthcare their way. We stood up and said, no, we want to do it our way. We don't accept that. We don't accept your, your government, your legislation. We try to turn it around and say, listen, this is what this is our problems. We have many, and this is what we need. So just to, and when you talk, you talk good words of sovereignty, but sovereignty also means unity. Unity is, 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 is going to be crucial moving forward. And just, I was at the court case. I've not been to many court cases that's got to do with the fiduciary land. But the white judge, when she saw us there, she appreciated the fact that even though we were a small group, that we were there. She acknowledged us, us as a group. Even when we had our, our native humor, she, she recognized that we, were, that we were a group and that we were together. Even though we were, we were a small group in that courtroom, but she did recognize, and that's something that we have to take back. You have to take back and start saying, hey, why are we fighting? Why are we fighting? We're stronger, we're stronger, we're stronger together. So the message is that, yes, we, we do listen. And when we have our social groups, and the other thing too is because of the oppression of the, the years of oppression, for us, change is slow. We're trying to break that. The change has been, has been slow. But I think, again, it will go faster if we go as a unit, as, as, as a unity. Again, like I was saying, sovereignty. Sovereignty, to me, means working together, working for ideas together, moving together, putting some differences aside, which is very difficult. And then we can move forward. Thank you, Chief. Yeah, Niala, for your words, uh, Greg. I think again, uh, really, really great comments, and I, 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 you know, want to start to get into conversation on next steps because I have a suggestion as well that I want to share that may be, uh, Jacqueline, uh, of use may need your assistance on it, and if something, um, 
you know, in terms of coming together and what that unity looks like. Because Greg is right. The unity from this point is crucial in terms of where we're going in our in our journey here. I'm going to I'm going to go back to uh, Michelle. I apologize, Hazel. Uh, Michelle did, I think, further have um, question comment uh, and then I'll go over to Hazel. So if I can, I'll look to Michelle. Um, so when you talk about they're not just um, specific to say you're not you're having a hard time they actually know they actually know that so it's almost like um it's almost like treatment. Treatment. so you know, here's here's the government here's the election ban, ban council so if if they were working underneath and kind of going against them. It's kind of like prison, right? So, you know what I mean? Like, because you're not working at a government to government level. So you're working, you're on, you're like, um, on a, I don't want to offend anybody either. It's almost like you use our like an umbrella underneath um, the, you know, how you talk, Mark talked about the rafters. So here you got rafters, the Canadians got raft, the Canadian government has a rafter that is, is um, joined by the elected band council on every territory. And then you got chiefs of assembly and you got first nation assembly. So they're like, they built their rafters, rafters around our people that helped them. So when they go against, when they're, they're when they're, they're putting up resistance against you, that's part of it is because they're not going to, they're not, not they're not going to bite off their own hands at feet basically. So th that's what I'm saying. Like, when it comes to, and I, and I get Mark, that's probably a part of the um, strategic part of it is bringing in the Confederacy because that is a huge part of uh, going against the um, Canadian government because you're talking nation to nation, not an entity, arms to the government. So that I see is a very, very, very big um, roadblock. So when I when I because when I look at roadblocks, when I look at roadblocks, I look at us physically putting a roadblock because we're tired of it. And we're not lying, we're not manipulating, we're saying we had enough. So the roadblock goes up, blah, blah, blah. But the reality of it is Canada has many roadblocks, metaphorically, in front of us. Band council to Indian Northern Affairs, to Chief of Assemblies, to First Nations Assemblies, to uh, provinces, to laws. Where's the Governor General? Like in order for us to get to where we're supposed to be really going is there's all these roadblocks in front of us. All these roadblocks are in front of us. The first roadblock is Indian Northern Affairs. That's your biggest roadblock because they have their foot right in the door and they are the ones that are stopping us from moving forward and they are the ones that are stopping us from excelling so that and that's and that's why i look at i look i try to look at things strategically i try to look at my mom said observe analyze and think of the logic what is the logic whether that logic makes sense to you to you does not necessarily mean it makes sense to me i look at the logic of why we're here what's happened what's transpired and what is becoming of it. And Indian Northern Affairs is a very big roadblock. And they have their foot in our, in, in our backyard. And that's what I'm talking about. Like, who's responsible to fix it? This band council, all of us as a community, or Canada? That's the big question. Who fixes it? because that's the same thing that's happening with residential school. Again, we have to fix it. We have to fix everything that Canada has done to us and is doing to us. We're busy fixing their mistakes. So when it comes to all that stuff and, they're, and those things, those barriers, their barriers are there because of reasons why. How do you break them down? Okay. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's a good good point. Sorry, oh. I just want to check in. I just want to check in again with uh, Michelle. Michelle, did you have further comment question? 
There you go. Perfect. And so thanks, Jackie and Jim. Yeah, for, for coming. And, you know, Jackie, when you first came here a couple months ago, you were, you wanted to build bridges, right? And I mean, I'm, I'm big on that. That's why I came in here. And I think a lot of us are here because we wanted to see that unity. And we've tried. I mean, four years of trying. And even years before that, councils have tried. And so I think what we need to do moving forward is to really change how we look at things. Personally, for me, I think, yes, we do have some struggles in our community, but we're a pretty brilliant, strong community. And so what I hear a lot of tonight is oppressive, oppressive, oppressive nature stuff. And so to me, I, I don't, I, I think we're stuck or, or certain people are stuck in that way. Whereas for myself, I'm like, there's so much opportunity for us. And, and I mean, I know the Kashwanta, I've studied it. I, I know what treaties are about, gone to the Confederacy to say, how do we do this, right? How can we all work together? We've done that. And I think, you know, I, I always tell people, it's great to use your voice. I welcome everybody to come into the council to voice their opinion, because this is what we need. It's, it honestly has been a hard four years trying to um, strengthen those relationships. And I think that's key to what we have to do. So we really have to take ownership of our own behavior, I think. And we can't expect other people to do it, but too long. And that's what Greg speaks about is that change, it, it's slow. But I think that over time, things can change. I'm not sure how long, but um, I really do want to extend a thanks to you for you know having the courage to come in. It, it felt like um, you were hearing a variety of things, right? But at the end of the day, I would just come in and ask, right? Just like you did. So and I encourage others to do that. We need to start to have those constructive conversations because without them, we will remain divided. And I mean, we're seeing what's happening in our community. So I think, you know what, we all need to take ownership of our actions and um, enough of the lip service, but let's start doing things. Okay, Nyawa, Nyawa, Michelle, again, really, really great comments and, and totally agree. And, you know, I think it's it's time that we that we do this. And, and you know, also want to uh, acknowledge uh, Jacqueline's guest, uh, Jim, as well. Uh, I want to say Nyawa to, uh, to co for coming in uh, with Jacqueline. I do see a number or a couple other hands uh, being raised. Um, and then I, I want to, I'll look to a suggestion that I want to bring up to maybe this is something that we can work towards i think it might be helpful uh over to you hazel and then sherry lynn hazel you have the floor Thanks. okay um first and foremost jacqueline i understand and hear what you're saying i think we all feel all of those things that you feel you know we all wish we could put everything to rest and just um everything becomes a smooth existence for all of us. Um, I don't like what's happening with the um, division of like what Michelle is saying, four years, well, it's eight for me now, where we've had many, many meetings trying to come together with the HEC and work together on behalf of all, all of our people because we all are the same type of people. We all are unique and nobody can take that from us. It's just like now we're, we're like in a situation of, you mentioned drugs and alcohol. None of us like that. We wanna see all of our people healthy and happy and, and um, but I think some of the oppression that's happened to the native people is what's created a lot. Uh, people uh, into drug trafficking so they can live. Um, if we could fix that, this council would fix that. Our police are working night and day to do just that. 
they have the the drug teams that are dealing with su such but like greg says slowly we're gonna slowly and surely we are going to get there one day uh the one thing about our teachings because i remember when i went to school we went to a one classroom school from grades one to eight and i remember sitting as a little one in grade one and you kind of listen to what the teachers say into the older kids and i remember they were talking about history you know, all that I remember them saying was that the Native people were drunkards. They liked the exchange of alcohol. Like, what a thing to put in a history book and teach the children who are Native. And now it's come full circle where the, our Native people are really on par and fighting back. Look at the residential situation. There was nothing so heartbreaking as to, to hear about the children that were murdered there and buried there. That was so, I can't even find the proper word to classify that. One thing I do know when you say the government is our hold back. Yeah, that's so true. Right now, Gawaneo School has been trying to get a school for it's now 35 plus years. They have gone from little buildings, they were put in schools that had been condemned. Now they're sitting on top of the arena of um, over at ILA. Well, thank you to the guy who owns that. He's done his best to help. Right now, there's a, a proposal that was submitted we were supposed to get um, an answer by the end of May, or no, end of May. No, it's the end of June. We're going into July, and still no word on whether they're going to give funding for that school. I'm afraid to see what will happen if they deny, they deny that funding this time. I, th is there any words left to tell those people? How do you see that fitting to make those kids have to carry water upstairs, one washroom for all the students and the teachers? It's, it's inhuman what they've got those kids going through. But you know what? They're proud. They're smart because those little children all speak the native language. They're kind kids. And those teachers don't give up, and neither does the parents or the kids. So I'm with you on what we want our reserve to look like. I'm really with you on that. But I think we have to get together. We have to get together and do it. Well, like, what is the song? Love can build a bridge, right? Maybe that's what we need. Thanks. I think too, like relating to um, residential schools, mm -hmm. that should have been put in. I always said that that should have been put into um, the residential school part of it. Yeah, that should have been put into the um, into that truth and reconciliation list because um, there was really nothing given back um, for us to succeed. Like um, so, they took the they took the kids and they put place them in home um, and schools. So, and took the language away, took our cultures away through that language. That should have been part of the reconciliation was Canada should be responsible to put schools on every one of our territories. And that should have been a must with top paying teachers, with top paying educators, because that's restoring what they took back. And that was never a part of the settlement. It seems like any settlement that comes, comes to us is in a form of money. That's like the day school, right? So throw some money at the Indians and let them, let them kill themselves through drugs, those that are addicted. So that's why I'm looking, I, I, I see those things like, and, and it disturbs me through those things too, because it's all about money, throwing money at us, throwing money at us. And, and it's like, okay, it's again, it's that same thing of the disobedient natives, Indians. Let's, let's, let's humor the Indians, throw some money at them. 
So those are, we have to change those things ourselves. We have to change those concepts ourselves. And, and, and if, we, if we have to stand up, if we have to organize something to go to Ottawa to make them pay for that school, then we should. That should be a part of it. Is every one of us should be going up to Ottawa and saying, you have a responsibility. That might be a part of it. How to, how to um, get that looked at because you know what? At some point, we got to stand up and fight for ourselves. Totally agree. Okay, I'm gonna go. Uh, I do have share related. Next. Oh. Sorry, I do want to acknowledge and say now to Hazel and her comments as well. I think it's all really good comments, and you know we have to get to this action of how this is going to, you know, happen and how we're going to implement. Uh, over to you, uh, Sherry Lynn. Yeah. Um, thank you for for coming, Jacqueline, and and speaking up. Um, the, you know, the truth and how you feel. I guess the part of it too is you're right. The government's trying to get out of the Indian business. <laughs> you know, it, it, that's why we see the health transformation, the housing transformation, the land management transformation, all these transformations. Because what you're speaking is, is, is the truth. And I guess for me, and not repeating about what everybody said, because they were all great comments, I guess for me, uh, Chief, is it possible, can we set up a meeting with ISP, with her and her concerns regarding um, the land, but also just how it was handled? The other thing is, um, I know that we were in, talk, you were in talks um, of getting our own down here um, with wills and lands so we can deal with it instead of having to go with, to ISP. So hopefully we, we can get that. Um, for ourselves to handle it here on Six Nations. And I guess the other thing I, I'm, I'm wondering also too is can we have a committee with some, some, some counselors and community members to talk about these, these hard discussions in the sense of these negotiations, what's happening in the community, um, all these types of thought, their thoughts and, and coming up with solutions together because what I've heard everybody talking about, we need to come together. And so let's start making a, a safe place for starting the path to be able to share and um, starting making some action on these things. You know, so those are just some of my comments. And again, um, uh, Jacqueline, thank you for coming and, and speaking from their heart and, and your truths. Okay, now uh, Sherry Lynn for your comments as well. And yes, really good suggestions. Can definitely work with uh, Jacqueline to, uh, you know, just to work on her um, her land and house issue. I know Jacqueline, we have touched base in the past on this matter, uh, and I know part of the challenge is, and you've you've already recognized it is family grievances. I mean, we could do so much, yes, but when a family is not speaking to others, or when other family members are you know, uh, are barred or what else, whatever is happening within the family, that is going to need the assistance of that family to do that internal work um, to, in order to, for us to, you know, better uh, suit to what Sherry Lynn is saying is, yes, we can meet with this, no problem. We've done that in the past on other matters with community members. And, you know, some have definitely worked out and some have been rectified uh, and some are still in progress. But I think the point is, uh, it's easy enough to get that done. The problem is, though, is family grievances with a lot of these issues. Like you say, the division within families, that's part of, that's been the biggest barrier because families can't agree upon for themselves. And that's that's a challenge. But I'd like to talk to you, uh, you know, off, uh, off the line, Jacqueline, uh, on that specifically. And we can work to, uh, we can work to set that meeting up uh, if you, if you would like. The other uh, piece I wanted to mention is is to share Lynn's comment of yes, I think it's important uh, to to come up with some type of uh, committee or whatever that looks like in order to have these conversations and to keep the continuity going. So to keep the conversation actually going. So it's not just you're here tonight and uh, it falls by the wayside. You know, we need to keep ourselves, I guess, uh, accountable to what our next steps are going to look like. And that was going to be one of my suggestions as well, because I had mentioned earlier the, uh, you know, I've, I've heard multiple versions of our history. 
Uh, and I think there's some validity validity in each of those versions, but I think that's the problem is we can't move forward because we don't truthfully know our own history, really, because there's so many versions of it. Who's right? Whose version is right? And it's not. I think that's where we got to start to eliminate who's right and wrong and focus in on more, uh, you know, the TLC. I think that's something that we definitely, to Hazel's comments within our community, but I wanted to suggest something, and this is something that's been on, on my mind for some time, and, and especially when you last visited in January, of maybe it's something of having a meeting, I don't know if we call it even a meeting, a meeting of the good mind, I'm not sure, but that we bring in every, like, I don't know if it's Chiefswood Park or something, but we have the men's fire, we have HCC, we have council, we have the Mohawk workers, we have all of these, uh, you know, all of our, our groups within our community come together and f once and for all start to have these frank conversations of the history and what that looks like and what version of, of, of each looks like. I think that's some, I mean, obviously it can't be led by council, you know, very biased. I don't want to, uh, to be a biased uh, start, but I think the most important group out of all of those groups that I listed is the people. Our people all need to be there and all need to be listened to and heard. And that's something where, you know, you eliminate all title and control and power. I know you've talked to, earlier on that, Jacqueline. The fact remains the power and control has always lied within the people. And that's something that I think we need to get back to. And maybe this is something of a start that we could at least have those frank conversations. Because I think that's part of the challenge of us, of you talk of roadblocks, of moving forward. Well, we still have young people who don't even understand our history and where we've been. How could we move forward when we don't know where entirely where we've been? You know, that's something that I think is important as well. So maybe there you know we can use assistance from yourself to see what this type of a meeting could look like it's got to be it, it has to be a meeting of of respect it has to be a meeting of all of our values and principles so that it is that safe place for, for more people to come and actually speak how they feel because you're right at times we can't say much in this community without being chastised or judged or anything else uh, and so I think that's something that maybe, and just throwing that as a suggestion, because I'm interested in the practical steps that we have to take. We can sit and talk and talk and talk. And yes, it's good. That's what our people are have always been about, is making sure that we have that conversation. But the conversation has to turn into, at some point, some actionable items, and that we take steps collectively together. So I'm just going to, I'll leave that there. But I know we do have um, we do have other um, uh, presenters this evening, so I don't want to don't want to hold them up too much longer. But again, not wanting to cut this important conversation off. But I think we need to get into some next steps of where do we go from this point. And I just wanted to share that suggestion. So I'm not sure if uh, if maybe any closing comments from yourself, uh, Jacqueline, uh, and then we can look to again the, what those next steps actually look like. So I'll maybe pass the floor over to yourself for some closing comment. Um, I have to sleep on it. I'll get answers in the morning and in the next couple of days. Um, there's there's a lot to digest, and um, I'll get back to you. Okay, that's that's totally uh, understandable. Oh, sorry, that's totally understandable, and do appreciate that. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll look to uh, stay in touch, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, and as you get again, you know, for the next steps, just let let us know, and I'll sit with, down with you on the other matters um, that you had brought forward. So maybe uh, look to uh, again schedule a meeting just with yourself on the other matters that you had brought forward um, as well. If, are there any further questions or comments? Again, really good meeting, a really good discussion. I think it's time it's been time and just want to re uh, reiterate uh, our again appreciation for you uh, Jacqueline and coming to speak uh, this evening and we'll look to again our next steps because we can't stop the conversation here 
So with that being said, I will look to a motion uh, to accept uh, Jacqueline's uh, presentation, I'll call it, for lack of a better term, as information at this time. Is there a mover to that effect? Moved by Greg, seconder. Second by Michelle. Are there any further final questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none motion is carried. Okay, Jacqueline, so I'll uh, I'll send you a text message in a follow-up with schedule um, and see when the, the next date we can get you into the office. Uh, in the meantime, I'll look to wait for you on that suggestion I brought forward to see if that is something that we could be working towards. So Niawa, Jacqueline, and Jim uh, for coming in this evening. I'll look to follow up on specifics. Okay, Council, I uh, want to uh, continue going down our agenda here. Um, our next, uh, sorry, just one second. Our next uh, delegation is Jamie Lynn Montour. Uh, I believe she's join, uh, joining us uh, on, online, uh, which is the app, an application for wedding officiant. So I'll, at this point in time, welcome uh, Jamie uh, to our council meeting. Uh, and I will uh, pass the floor uh, over to Jamie uh, to walk us through her request. So good evening uh, and welcome, Jamie. Hey everyone, um, don't mind my mess. I'm uh, not feeling very well today. So I've been kind of sleeping on and off all day, uh, which leaves me kind of in that brain fog of what exactly it was I was asking for, because there's a lot going on, right? So I mean, the fact that I caught the end of that last delegates discussion, you know, kind of, validates why I'm why I'm here, why I sit here, why I do what I do, what I try and accomplish in my own personal self, right? So for me, you know, born and raised on Six Nations, 44 years, and finally reconciling with who I am as a spiritual self, understanding who I am holistically and what my purpose is here. I really, I really don't know exactly where I fit in per se. I know that a lot of me wants to inspire others into doing that self-discovery journey into becoming more aware of who they are, what their purpose is. And a lot of what I do is to support that. So with this wedding officiant application, when I first came into that want to be <laughs> or to pursue that, I had attended a wedding and it wasn't a religious wedding and it wasn't a traditional wedding it was a more elemental recognition so understanding creation and its elements and how you know unifying a love bond between two individuals needs to be a joyous celebration we need to bring joy back into our lives and bring celebration back into our lives and do so in a way that's conducive to their beliefs not expected beliefs or religious beliefs or traditional beliefs but you know just wherever they stand just stand with them and be their efficient <laughs> that's really what I was aiming for so I didn't know I wanted to really do it until I saw that and then it was kind of a joke to me where it's like those who can't do teach but you know, I, I realize, you know, a lot of, 
a lot of me had a lot of healing to do. So a lot of my journey in the last four or five years has been specific to my own self-discovery, my own journey to healing and reconciliation through my own truths, through my own passion, purpose, which is really finding myself. And it helped a lot that I was doing these day school applications because in that process, I was, I was realizing the amount of injustice that that whole process has, to be honest. Two and a half years to deal with adverse childhood experiences. I really, I was disheartened by the fact that, you know, it's a one and done application when the potential for healing when it comes to looking at that foundational part of our youth you know that creation of our limitations that creating those those years of limit limiting beliefs that were conditioned into us ingrained in us the things that I had to work through for me to be able to step forward, for me to even be on this call. You know, I'm nervous as ever being on this call. I've never thought that I'd be sitting, you know, before band council. I didn't see myself really involved with the community because I was of the belief that I wasn't meant to be in this community. And I didn't realize that that was, you know, somebody else's words that were still impacting me from childhood because I was a registered Delaware. Living on Six Nations, everybody, you know, figures, what are you doing here? You're not even of the six. So I figure I'm, I'm of that seventh. <laughs> And it's, uh, for me, there's a sacredness to seven. So I'm going to take ownership of being in that seventh and figure out what it is I can do to better impact the community from my, from my, you know, my business, my, myself, my, my tools, my gifts, the uniqueness that I carry, the connections that I contain, you know, I have, I have an ability to maybe not talk right now, but um, I don't know, there's, there's some reason that I'm here. And if it's to marry people, if it's to unite them or celebrate them, that's just one thing, right? If it's to advocate for them, that's another. So, I mean, there's no end to what my potential impact could be, but it's just, in the meantime, I'd like to be able to marry people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, now I have so much, uh, Jamie, again, very, uh, it's, uh, first of all, do you appreciate yourself uh, in you coming forward uh, in this matter? And you are a part of this community. So thank you for the work that you do and Yama for that. Um, specifically to the application of the wedding wedding officiant, I wanna look to council uh, to see if there are any questions or comments. So again, the resolution or the recommendation rather uh, reads that we would compose an authorization letter uh, that will support Jamie Lynn Montour uh, with her application to become a wedding officiant. So I guess that's uh, that would be part of the process to apply to become. So looking to see at this point for any questions or comments for Jamie. I see uh, Michelle has her hand raised and then over to Helen. Michelle, you have the floor. So I had asked this yesterday when we received this that, um, I, I mean, you're asking certain things that there's pre-work that needs to be done before it comes here. So has that work been done to actually confirm the information that you need to put in your letter? Because I think we're a little premature putting forward a motion if that hasn't been done with the membership. Is that for me? Because I don't really even know 
what that is. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Michelle. Are are you you ref sorry, Michelle? Can you just clarify? Are you referring to you refer to membership? Yeah. So it says as part of her application, the letter needs to confirm she's a band registered band member um, and two other things. So I, I mean, we don't do that here at the council table. But someone's got to give us that info, right? So has all of that been done? Was my question. Okay, so yes, uh, that has the one part that you had mentioned. I'm not, sorry, I don't have the paper in front of me, but the, the first part is yes, uh, is confirmed that yes, she is a registered band member. Further questions, comments over to you, Helen. Sorry, Helen, you're on mute. <laughs> I'm sitting here kind of shaking my head. I've always known Jamie's family and them to be registered band members, so I don't know what that was about. <laughs> um, I think it's a good idea what she wants to do. I went to a wedding recently where this lady was marrying these, this couple, and it was totally different from what I've ever used to and what I've grown up with, and I thought it was so nice the way she the way she conducted the ceremony. So I think it's a really good idea. Really, you know, I've been following Jamie and her journey and I think she's done so much work on herself and I just love listening to all her, reading all her posts about what she's doing. I think it's great. I wish everybody could do that. Come to know themselves. They've known myself, I think ever since I was probably 13 when I realized who I was and what I wanted and I, and I always knew who I was and I always knew where I belonged and what I should be doing. And I've done it. So I think it's a really good idea to have her come up with some kind of a really nice wedding ceremony for people that isn't normally following what you usually follow. But that one I went to, it was really inspiring for me to see how this lady conducted the ceremony and it was really nice. So would support council writing a letter of support for her if I don't know what's required to apply to be a wedding to marry people I have no idea what the process is but I would support count, uh, Jamie um, putting in an application to do that okay uh, thank you now I have uh, Helen for your comments I think again really good comments uh, and uh, we will look to the recommendation uh, again council this is uh, for an application so just to to Helen's point it would be as uh, basically like an attachment of a support a letter to her application I see a couple of hands uh, raised uh, further uh, Sherry Lynn over to Kiri um, just just quickly uh, I'm glad to see this it's hard to find somebody uh, <laughs> And you got to call around and you usually don't get what you want so i'm glad that um jamie's here and really understand the open mind of it's about the the people who are getting married and about their words and how they want to to celebrate their and be united so i totally agree with it um to have that um somebody in the option in our community to to be able to call upon her so i'm in agreement with that so good job, Jamie. Okay, Nyawa, uh, thank you for your comments. Again, good comments as well. Uh, Sherry Lane, uh, I'm gonna keep going down uh, the list here and then we'll look to entertaining the recommendation. Uh, over to you, Carrie. Yeah, Jamie, with, the, with, this, uh, with this letter, do you send it on further or does that, is someone above you or whatever have to, give you the authority to marry people or, or is it, does it, so where does this letter go from, from here? So the way I understand it is that I would be, I would be free to conduct. It's not like I'd be regulated by an administrator by any means. However, what they're asking for is, you know, if 
something were to happen to me, at least somebody from maybe council could let them know that, you know, she's no longer around or whatever, but it's not like I'd be under any religious scope. There is like, um, what is it? There are certain rules when it comes to marrying people that have to be abided by, and that's the minister of, uh, I can't think of it right now, but it, it's under the act itself, the marriage act. So I just have to abide by those rules and regulations. Okay, thanks. Oh, sorry, no, I was on mute. <laughs> Apologies. Thank you, Nyawa, for that, uh, Kiri. Uh, is there any further questions or comments? Again, so this would be obviously to be able to practice within the province of Ontario. So uh, we know that that would have to go through their application process. So this, again, would be supporting her application. Uh, if there's no further questions or comments, I'll look to um, a mover and seconder to uh, move on the recommendation. I see Nathan as a mover. Is there a seconder? I will. I will. Sure, but... Seconded by Sherry Lynn. Are there any further uh, questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. We get that letter done quickly. Moved by Nathan. Seconder? I'll second Sherry Lynn. Seconded by Sherry Lynn to waive second reading on the previous motion. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Okay, Jamie, well, again, congratulations and do agree. Yes, keep up the great work. Um, and we will, uh, I'll work with you to get the letter of support to, uh, to supply your uh, application. All right, yeah. So now uh, take care and I hope you feel better. <laughs> Have a good day. Yeah. Okay, council, I'm gonna continue moving along the agenda here. Uh, our next delegation is a presentation from both uh, Bonnie Whitlow as well as our Director of uh, Parks and Recreation, Cheryl Hanhock. Uh, this is going to be a presentation on a disc golf course project. So with that, with that being said, I want to welcome and say uh, Scano uh, to both Bonnie and Cheryl. Uh, and I'll pass uh, the floor uh, over to uh, each of you ladies. So welcome. So, hello, Chief, uh, Council, and others. Um, Nyawa for allowing us to present some information about the disc golf uh, course construction project that we're trying to get off the ground. Uh, Bonnie Whitlow came to me last year uh, about uh, having a dream to produce or uh, construct a course at Six Nations. So, our plan is to put it behind the sports fields on the south side. And uh, we applied for funding from the Community Development Trust in 2022, and they have contributed 46000 to the project. So Bonnie thought it would be a great idea to uh, just give an update to the council uh, about where we are. Um, we're just at the rudimentary stage, so to speak. We're still planning, still trying to uh, provide or me, get a direction of how much or uh, how far our $46,000 can go towards the project. So I'd like to turn it over to Bonnie. Bonnie is the one that with the vision for this course. She's an avid uh, disc golf player who belongs to, I believe, three or four clubs. And uh, this is one of her projects that we can um, support, our Parks and Recreation is supporting, and we'd like to see possibly happen this year. So Bonnie. Hey, Sago Sago Michael. I'm not sure my video doesn't seem to be working. Um, it's on, but, um, and I'm not sure who has the uh, presentation. I have one on my screen, but I know I was had to send one in. Okay, yeah, maybe I would I'll that. do, sorry, just really quickly, uh, Bonnie, maybe I can get Brooke. Sorry if I'll just check in with Brooke. Yes. Yep, I can do a share screen. Just give me one okay, second, perfect. 
So, Bonnie, you'll just have to give uh, Burke Q uh, when to uh, change the slides and so forth. Okay. I'm just going to go super quick. I know we only have 20 minutes, and uh, this was a sure. presentation that we gave. We've given to, I'm not sure, I think it was the political liaison committee, you called it, Cheryl, and then the other was to um, the trust. Correct, yes. Okay, uh, Nyama for that, uh, Bonnie, so we'll just uh, look to Brooke to get that on the screen. Okay, there we go. Back over okay. to you, uh, Bonnie. Okay, so this is just the uh, title slide, if you could go to the second. Okay, so these are the people that we were currently working with when we uh, created the presentation. So there was myself, my son, who, as Cheryl said, we are avid disc, golf court, disc golfers and are members of four different clubs. Joshua Cowell is also from Six Nations and is the president of the Brandt Disc Golf Club. Chris Ozalins is the executive director of the ODSA, uh, which is the Ontario branch. And Craig Snow is the president of the Paris Disc Golf Club. And these um, three have all agreed to uh, help us build the court, uh, uh, the entire course, including doing the physical labor. The next slide. So this was just uh, to show you that it's an all year uh, round, uh, full year um, sport. There's never an off season and you can play it 365 days a year. Next slide. Oh, that was just about the ODSA and that there is currently now a professional disc golf association and that it has become um, uh, an official sport that is um, worldwide and that um, you can make or you can have a full blown career in this sport now making millions of dollars for people who are uh, becoming pros. Next slide. This is the area um, that has been identified that we'll, we will use behind the blue track. Um, um, so actually this was before we realized that there's three acres of green space at the bottom of the slide that can also be included in this. I think it was a full 18 acres. Um, and then the, the uh, little graphic was just to show you the um, what we have to go through. We have to do the mapping, the installation, the course design, um, and then training for people who are coming in and things like an opening ceremony. Next slide. Um, the biggest part of it for me was um, that you can't really enjoy the sport if you're if you don't build properly and correctly. So we were lucky to have the people involved that are that we do, and that they're all um, they're all professional disc golfers as well as have designed and built several courses um, all over Toronto. Oh, what's going on? Um, and so these are the design principles that they use. I can't remember off the top of my head the name of this uh, organization, um, but they've created all of the basics that you would need to make sure that the people can go out and have fun and still be safe. So we would have to use all of these principles in order to, to design the full course. Next slide. Um, there are different things that we have to go through in order to create um, a full course. Um, we uh, looked at $36,000 was our estimate, about $1,000 per tee pad um, that we would be putting in. Um, my goal was actually to have us do or use pavers for each because there's an artistic element that we could have included um, and I thought it lent itself very well to the creation of wampum belts and other kind of Haudenosaunee specific iconography that we could use, um, that it becomes a, a, a great tourist attraction as well. 
So this was just an example of some of the belts or some of the images that we could use on the T-pads if we were to include pavers. And then the steps that you were seeing on the side um, was included just so you had a sense of what the builds would look like. Next slide. So these were examples of signage um, uh, that's needed on the course. These are just the T-pad signs. There are other signs that would also have to come along with it. Things like um, uh, directional arrows so people knew how to navigate the course. There's things like warnings for things like uh, that let people know that discs are flying through and there's uh, hazards. And so to be aware of things, um, if you go to the next slide, I think it also shows you, oh no, that's not the one. Uh, later in this presentation, you'll see like the, um, the entrance markers and the spaces where you uh, can set up the bulletin boards, et cetera. So the T-pad and the T-sign installation uh, came out to uh, $36,000. So if you can go to the next slide, these are the basket and what the basket installation uh, requires. And I think we put that at $500 per installation. So um, there would be 18 baskets that we would put in along with a couple of practice baskets at the beginning. Next slide. These are the other elements. So as you can see, there's these um, entrance kind of kiosks where you can uh, post information about the clubs that you're going to create, the leagues that you're going to create, um, and the mm -hmm. tournaments and other kind of disc golf uh, information. Most courses around here have uh, those entrance kiosks. It's also a place where you put like the um, lost and found boxes, et cetera, and whatever notices are necessary. Um, you need, of course, you need garbage cans, you need benches, and you need tables. And so mm -hmm. at the time, I actually haven't looked at the budget uh, since this last uh, presentation, but I simply ran, or I did a, a Google search for the purchase of these specific items um, and then uh, submitted that as the final cost. The one thing that I forgot to do with this and I um, and I apologize, Cheryl, but the, I forgot to include the shipping costs on this. So even though we might've put in for, um, I think it was six tables and six benches and six uh, garbage cans, I don't think we would get that many because I forgot to uh, include shipping. Okay, the next slide. Um, so we applied to the trust. The trust uh, gave us $46,000. As far as I know, it's unrestricted for us to start doing the build. Uh, the difficulty is, is with only the $46,000, um, it's, it's insufficient. And it's insufficient because it would be, while we could put in the... Uh, baskets and the tea pads, there would be no uh, level of difficulty. It would be essentially the same as having 18 of the exact same fairways that are wide open with, you know, um, no, with no difficulty whatsoever, or having uh, a mini putt with the exact same 18 perfectly straight uh, little, I don't, I know you don't call them a fairway, but whatever that is. And so um, while you could have people out there and we could start teaching and we could start including the kids and creating um, an interest in the sport itself, uh, without the additional funding, it's going to be extremely boring. Um, I don't think anybody would want to go to a disc golf or a regular golf course with the exact same 18 open fairways, like nobody would want to do that. And so it was unfortunate that they only um, uh, approved that $46,000. We can get tee pads and baskets in the ground, but we have to create uh, um, some variety and some interest and some targets. And uh, if you go to the next slide, Um, 
you want challenges, you want things, you want to create the idea of islands, you want to create the idea of mazes or just some sort of difficulty. And so that would come with the additional funding that uh, we were looking for. I think um, I think it was 104.5, Helen, or sorry, Cheryl, do you remember? 104.5, was that what it was? Total cost? Yeah. I think it was 104. Uh, it's 126,000. Was it 126? Okay, sorry. Yes. Um, and we received, like I said, the 46. So there's a, a funding gap that we'd uh, like to make up. If you go to the next slide. Um, there was also the inclusion of a machinery purchase that was uh, required. Um, and that would be to do the maintenance um, on the course itself. I know that uh, this cost itself has already gone up since we submitted that first proposal. If you go to the next slide. The other part of it um, that we included was $8,000 for renaturalization. So part of the creation of the course would include um, um, indigenous plant species, uh, trees, and shrubs, and bushes, and um, because we have so many ticks, I was going to uh, include like uh, beds of, you know, mints and lemon balm and citronella and all of those types of plants that uh, ticks don't like. And hopefully we could uh, mitigate some of the problems that we have on the res with those, uh, those ticks in particular. So we put in for $8,000. Again, I think that's probably low, but when we were putting this in originally, um, we were doing a kind of um, a phased installation and I was looking at uh, two or three years of, of phases. If you go to the next slide. So these are some of the ideas that we could use. Um, I was, if you look at the dish with one spoon and then you look right above it with the little hole, I thought that would be one of the ways that we could create a very quick kind of challenging little course. Um, and then there's another opportunity on the right hand side with the, I'm not even sure if that's, I think that might be the friendship belt. Um, that we could use the images like that and we could use uh, fencing and we could use uh, almost like a weaved sort of plastic piece. Um, and then it also lends, once we create um, and use those particular pieces of iconography, we can also, as you'll see later, we can do a kind of, um, Oh, what's the other project that I was doing? The other project is called Haudenosaunee Go, but there's an opportunity for us to drive traffic through uh, an app to spaces where all of these belts are already um, described and, and people could engage with our kind of history and our treaty history and our wampum belt history. And none of that would have to be something that we would have to recreate. We could really just create, use the app that I'm already creating for another project in order to um, drive traffic to stuff that is already on the web that we wanna use. The next slide, please. So this was another idea um, um, because it's uh, mainly a big open space with very little uh, challenge. Uh, the idea of creating islands or false islands that they would have to land in. So you would have to uh, hit straight to the island. Otherwise, it would be out of bounds. We could use things like this other wampum and we could use brickwork to create it. Um, so we had we had put in uh, art features at $20,000 and I thought we could possibly get three to four different art features into this um, right off the beginning and we could do more work later to create the other ones as well. But the original design itself, we would uh, design all 18 holes and then we would just continue to do art features each year until we could finish the entire course. Next slide. 
that was just another one. And that was, <laughs> I'm sorry, on the left, I am really bad with graphic design <laughs> and I didn't have anyone help me, but <laughs> the idea was to kind of give you a sense of what it would look like standing up. And I thought it would be cool to have um, the main wampum belt that this would be the main uh, first one that we would do, including some uh, white pines in the middle. And then ideally I wanted this in the direction of the sunset because I thought it would make a very cool picture to be standing at a tea pad and to be actually looking at a Hiawatha wampum belt and then using the squares and the um, upstanding rectangles as mandos or targets that you would have to go through on either side. You would have to hit one of those on either side in order to go all the way to the end um, and get to the basket. Next slide. This was an art piece that um, I was uh, I had collaborated on a few years ago that was at the Hamilton Art Gallery. Um, it currently, it's called, uh, I think it was called Exploring Between the Two Rows. It was a, um, there's a group called the Aluminum Quilting Society. This piece is humongous and it's currently sitting in somebody's uh, garage in pieces, like in, in panels. And so I spoke to the, the other artists and they were all more than happy to say we could use this. So what I thought we would do is because this is between two rows, on the left-hand side is the ship, on the right-hand side is the canoe. And there was this big, huge figure that is kind of uh, straddling both uh, vessels. It would be very cool to take this apart and put it up and then create a mando where you would have to shoot between the ship and the canoe. And then you, again, you would have this really cool art piece that um, becomes a tourist attraction. Next slide. Oh, and that one is for free. The phase two of it is the community building pieces. And so it comes to the training and the inclusion of schools. There's opportunities for us to have uh, people come in and run clinics by age um, to establish and register a league with the ODSA. Um, and with the PDGA to create summer and March break camps, we could apply for that funding um, and we could partner with the local universities. Uh, in particular, I was thinking um, the Waterloo campus of Laurier has often asked me as a person from Laurier if they would like, um, they've always wanted to do some work in the communities and do outreach work. So I thought that would be an opportunity for us to do something there. Uh, tournament for local schools, of course. This is an all ages kind of activity. Um, and all, not just all, all ages, but all abilities. So this is people, all people can play this no matter what age you are. It's a walk through the park. Essentially, you're walking around with a few discs and you're picking it up and you're going to the next place. It's played exactly like golf. Exactly. You have uh, fairway drivers, you have distance drivers and you have putters. They all have different flight patterns and it's extremely challenging. And I'd invite all of you to come and play around with me um, just so you would have a sense of how this game is played and really how addictive it is, how fun it is, how challenging it is. And for me, playing in all of these leagues, my first question is, where are all the brown people? Um, it is a white male sport at this point. Um, I don't know what the actual statistics are on that, but I would say um, maybe 80% white male. Um, and then the rest of it is like the women who have started to get in, but I wanted us to be there. We're not seen there in these spaces and there are huge opportunities and they just haven't seen us play yet. We have um, athletes, world-class athletes and all of these other sports and we're not in this sport yet. So I wanted to push it, but not just here. I wanna see all of our reserves get this. I wanna see this become like a confederacy challenge and I want this to go to NAG. And so I just wanted to, um, start to get us as involved as possible. So next slide. And this is what I was talking about. So um, that was just, um, I'm creating an app um, for, um, um, to do uh, land-based work and um, uh, indigenous uh, place. 
And so I thought using that same technology that we're already creating for another um, project that I'm working on would be very easy to translate it. And it's essentially, you know, we'd hang something in the air. We would use um, an enhanced, um, an enhanced, I can't even remember what it's called, augmented reality, that's what it's called. Um, and you can hang it there. You would be able to walk around and you could do things like, I could create a Ganyot Geha uh, lexicon and teach people the words in Ganyot Geha. All they would have to do is point their phone at it. And we could have, you know, Ongwana uh, Ganjokwa or Gawaniyo uh, involved and we could film them. And that type of stuff would be there. So it's an opportunity for us to uh, share the language. Um, and last year, it would have been the first on reserve course in North America, except for the Paul Macbeth Foundation has just recently partnered with the Rosebud Reservation uh, for the Dakota Nation, and they are currently building um, a disc golf course there. So we'd be still be the first in Canada, and we're probably the first one that is Indigenous led. Um, but unless we get it in the ground in the next month or two, they might beat us to be being the first. So I think that's the last slide. Next slide. Is there another? Yeah, it's just questions. So if you have any questions, uh, Cheryl and I would be happy to answer them. Okay, uh, Nyawa yeah, so much, uh, Bonnie, for uh, walking us through your presentation. It's quite uh, quite interesting, to be honest. Uh, I uh, I know. I think I was even at one point going to come out and you were going to teach me how to do this because um, I was interested in. Indeed, and I still very and much you. Am, so I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll still take you up. Yeah, on that. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure, Mark. Sure. <laughs> I invited you, and then you dusted. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I didn't want to get I didn't want to get shamefully beat. <laughs> I was going to teach you how I would have been gentle. <laughs> well, thank you so much again. I think it's 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 needed. I, I like to see the um, the the different types of sports getting getting involved. You know, I think there was like even for example, uh, I know there was a uh, one of our members, uh, you know, starting a rugby league, for example. You know, sports that we don't necessarily, you know, the 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 dominant sports, obviously within community, uh, that we see, you know, on a daily. But it's nice to, to get, uh, you know, interest from maybe potentially other uh, types of sports like disc golf. So it's I'm uh, I'm excited to see see this happen and be a part of the uh, parks and recreation. I always say, uh, you know, that that area is really it's the it's the hub of our community you know it's it's become really a, a, a gem of an area where everybody gathers and so to have this as an addition i think would just complement uh, you know what's already there as well but my questions and i do see a couple of hands being raised uh so the gap obviously we want to talk about finances so cheryl is there any dollars that will help offset that gap within your budget? Uh, unfortunately, I like just have five grand. Um, okay. Pardon? Sorry, sorry, Cheryl, go ahead. I, unfortunately, I just had put in the $5,000 on towards it because um, our former chief financial officer said she was going to take care of the rest for us. And, uh, but, um, I think that's fallen through the cracks, unfortunately, for us. So, um, no, I, you know, just beyond that five, I don't have any more funding. Okay. Okay. Thanks uh, for answering that question. And then I also noticed uh, in terms of the maintenance, there was a machine. I think there was a slide with the machine cost. Is there anything like uh, currently on our roster of machinery that could be utilized to maintain this? Yes, I believe we have we have a couple tractors that could possibly be used, so we don't really have to invest in a new one. Um, but we do we don't have a bush hog, which is what kind of uh, mower mower equipment we were thinking that we were going to need for for there. But that's you okay. know so that hopefully it could be a, a less cost. 
Okay, thanks. So what's at this point with the 5,000 that you have, what's the total outstanding number? So we're thinking we, it was, we were using the number of 126,500. That was the overall cost that was presented last, last um, September in 2022 to the trust. And so then with 46, so we're a little over 51,000. So that would be you know approximately 75,000 that we're still looking for. Um, we'd also, um, Bonnie was mentioning about the uh, shipping costs, but I, I presume then she's saying it's very uh, significant. So that's, she was cautioning us on that, that that was not included in our original budget of 126. Okay, so uh, I guess we would have to kind of know those those numbers uh, in order for then you know coming up with a finance plan. So if we can get those numbers, I think that would help us okay. do more of our own due diligence on our side to okay. see where we could potentially assist. Um, the other question I have is sorry, and I do apologize. I know I'm going to get to Greg and Sherilyn. The other question I have is in relation to I think Bonnie, you had mentioned uh, Ontario obviously has a type of uh, league or um, association. Um, is there any opportunities for funding like this through the associations? Not a lot. Um, I have talked to several uh, groups. So Christy League, um, Christy Lake League has said they would be willing to do a fundraiser and that their membership themselves would be interested in coming to help. There's another fundraising group um, I forget their name uh, for Ontario. Um, and both of those look like maybe $1,000. The ODSA has already told us that they would give us $1,000. Uh, the PDGA has also said they would give us $1,000. All of them I would just have to go back to once this was through. And then the one that I was uh, considering, um, and I, I don't even think I've talked to you about it yet, Cheryl, is the guy, Paul Macbeth, who is creating the disc golf course in um, the Rosebud Reservation. He has a foundation um, that we could apply to. And it would actually be kind of cool because he's the he's like the Michael Jordan of disc golf. And it would be cool if we could, um, I don't know, maybe make an application to them um, to see if we could get him to come here. Because if he came here, that would be... Uh, a huge boon. So there are other places that we could apply, but that would uh, take time. Uh, and it would be, I don't know which phases we'd, uh, we'd be looking at by then, but there are other opportunities. Okay. All right. Now for that. Um, okay. I'm going to go to quest further questions, comments from counselors. First, beginning with uh, Sherry Lynn, and then over to Greg. And then I see uh, Michelle also has uh, comment question in the chat. Over to you, uh, Sherilyn. Um, yeah, some of them were answered. I guess um, this was brought to Human Services uh, a while back, <clears throat> and now to see where it is today. This is this is something different for the community, and I think it's exciting. I played I played this probably about twenty five years ago in Oklahoma, <laughs> so to finally see it here in Ontario <laughs> and hear it here in our own community that is exciting. So um, I guess what, what I was wondering was just the same as what Michelle wrote was the full the budget, but also um, if we can have it in phases, like how much this would make them like nine holes or and then the other nine holes, um, more of a plan so we can really figure out um, and crunch the numbers for them. That was all. Thank you. OK, so my guess is the 46 that we currently have from the trust we could use for the design and the installation of the installation and maybe a bit of the renaturalization costs. I don't think we would get all of the um, the full pieces that we had submitted for those costs because I think signage we put in for 10,000, I think we put baskets in for 10,000 and we put um, all of the tea pad installations for uh, 36. So what we have would be very, very basic. It would essentially be um, kind of just 
uh, tea pads and baskets out in a field with, like I said, zero difficulty whatsoever. Um, it would be it would be fairly simple, I think, to show you how far we could take that. Um, and then I'd be happy to prioritize the next parts of the build and maybe look back and see what costs have gone up for those shipping costs and the things that I had submitted, including um, if you wanted the machinery, Cheryl, we can still uh, redo those costs and reach out and get the machine that you actually think is needed. Um, because I think when I did that first one, um, I misunderstood what you were looking for. Uh, I don't know machines at all. I'm just a writer. So, <laughs> so I'd be happy to go back in and do a little bit more work and present this again. Um, I'm not sure um, what the timeline is. Like, when would you expect me to come back to council? Okay, so I would, uh, I'll, I'll look to uh, both uh, yourself and Cheryl to see, you know, in terms of getting all of those uh, pieces together. Okay. Um, because again, it, we, it, we can put you on either, you know, maybe the next finance meeting might be the next best spot so that we can maybe do some due diligence on our end, but we'll, we'll definitely need those pieces beforehand so that we could have a okay. more formed uh, discussion and then actually get to decision points on you know, hard numbers and, on, and okay. things like that. So maybe that might be my suggestion as we aim for the next uh, finance, or if that's too early, we'll go the following as well. So, but uh, that would be my suggestion. When would that be? Uh, just to clarify, I think the next one is, so we'd have to go, actually the next one might be too soon. We'll go then the following general finance mm -hmm. meeting, Cheryl, if that's okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Latter part so of at least July. That, yeah, yeah. That okay. at least gives yeah, you, that's plenty you know, of time. About over three weeks or so. Yeah, that's get, plenty of time. Yeah. Okay, that worked. Um, sorry, just want to go over to uh, Greg at this point, and then there's a couple of comments, questions in the chat. Greg, you have the floor. Yeah. Well, thank you for the presentation. It's uh, yeah, it sounds exciting. It sounds different. Um, Aside from calling it the uh, wood tick golf course, I think uh, <laughs> it, um, it it looks like it might be you know fun, for, especially for the young people get started in it. Um, and uh, the only comment that I had, I think uh, all my questions have been answered uh, so far. But um, yeah, and I think that yearly maintenance I'll probably be worked in the budget. And um, I think uh, I, right now it's it looks as though you just to get started, you'd need about seventy five thousand just to get going. Mm -hmm. And um, it looks like you're going to have to plant a, quite a few trees and, and other vegetation. But uh, other than that, yeah, mm -hmm. it looks good. It looks good. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Well, for that, uh, Greg, uh, just really quickly, um, just from uh, Michelle, uh, are, do you plan to reapply to the trust as the deadline is this Friday? Oh, Question? <laughs> no, not if it's no. Friday. <laughs> And I can find the time to get that done. Okay. All right. That was just a question in the chat. And then also um, to Sherilyn, and good point to Sherilyn on, on, you know, you, uh, that's why I had asked on utilizing whatever we have on the roster. So maybe I'm not sure if Public Works even has a bush hog or maybe even uh, A6N. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's where we could look at some collaborations on some in-kind contributions that might offset the overall budget. So maybe okay. uh, Cheryl, maybe the, I, that could, I, could, I could task that with you to be added as one of your pieces of information. Yes. Okay, can do. Okay. Yes. All right, that, that sounds good. Are there any further questions or comments? So it sounds like we have a plan of action. Again, really exciting work and now for all uh, that you're doing. I mean, I, I know it's, uh, it's, it's most of the time in your spare time, I would assume. <laughs> So do appreciate uh, your, your your contributions to this project, uh, and definitely would like to see it through. I think it's uh, to everyone's point. It's quite interesting. I think it gives another uh, another kind of um, I guess uh, interest within community of you know who may uh, want to get involved in in disc golf. So I think it's a cool idea. 
Um, it's just a matter of uh, getting the numbers, crunching the numbers, and uh, seeing how we could best support. I think we could. What we could be doing as well, though, is is keying in on the in kind contributions. So if that might be helping, and helpful. Yeah, to help offset the bigger costs, because mm -hmm. I think uh, I think we have enough pieces of collaboration to go around to uh, to assist. Okay. Okay, so that I want you to publicly commit to a round of disc golf course disc golf with <laughs> <laughs> in front of all of these people. Oh, like, okay, we definitely have to set a, a training practice for sure. Before <laughs> <that. laughs> um, I, I'm in for that too. Okay. Um, Okay, so what we'll do then at this point, Council, is there is a recommendation on the agenda. Uh, it is, again, to accept as information the presentation at this time, uh, maybe with the added um, words of Cheryl and Bonnie to come back to the, uh, not the next, but the the pro, uh, the next one after finance, so about three weeks. Okay. So if we could include that in the motion to be back in front of finance to then further look on how we can uh, best support uh, this project. So is there a mover to that effect? Moved by Nathan. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Greg. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, I'm not seeing any at this point in time. I'll go to the vote, all in favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing a motion is carried. Okay, well, now it's so much, uh, ladies. Uh, it's, uh, again, an exciting uh, project, and well, let's see how we can get it done. Now, yeah, Chief and Council, greatly appreciate the opportunity to let you know about this project today. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Bonnie. Yep, Ona. 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 Okay, Council, uh, we do have uh, Ona, Cheryl. We do have uh, one more uh, presentation delegation, which is uh, ethics application. Uh, this is to, titled uh, Autism in First Nations Communities. I know obviously we are undergoing our ethics and from, I'm sure obviously Nathan and Michelle can speak more onto the, uh, the efforts of uh, really uh, streamlining and transitioning the ethics um, process really. So that being said though, we do have a, uh, an application request we have a grant uh, Bruno online uh, with us to speak uh, to his application. Uh, so with that being said, I wanna welcome and say scan out, say go grant, uh, and I'll pass uh, the floor uh, over to yourself to give us just a high level overview of your application and then we'll get into further questions or comments. So welcome grant, over to you. Yeah, for sure. So you don't need a PowerPoint or anything. I could just do this verbally and that's fine. Yeah, I think verbal verbal works. Yes. Okay. Yeah. For sure. So Tanse, Grant Bruno, Nisika Sin, Maskochizo Chinia. Hello, everybody. My name is Grant Bruno. I am from uh, a large community, much like yours, uh, Muscochise, Alberta. It's a community of about 18,000 people. We're actually make a, made up of four different reserves. So I know, and that kind of confused me when I first started doing a little bit of work with the Six Nations. I thought it was six different reserves, like my community. My community, sometimes the reserves don't get along, sometimes they do. But I'm actually really grateful because me being from the community, I'm also a, a parent to autistic children. I have four children. And so currently I'm a, I'm a PhD student in medical sciences in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Alberta, going into what looks like my final year. So I'm just in the process of doing data collection now. And so with my research and how it's kind of evolved, I'm really excited to be able to you know, ask for your approval on a, on a new initiative that I'm doing within my PhD. So my PhD is really broken down into four parts. The first part is a scoping review that really explores what all the, all the academic literature looks like uh, regarding Indigenous peoples, autism, all within Canada. And so this was recently accepted into the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disabilities Journal. It's a very high impact journal that I think is going to have a lot of, um, I guess, influence for the new Bill S-203, which is the national autism strategy that the federal government is rolling out. They just actually approved this in the House of Commons. And so this fall, they're gonna be looking for research just like mine to really inform that, that national autism strategy from, from indigenous peoples by indigenous peoples. Um, so that's one study. The second study is me working with elders in my community. So me being Nehio, a uh, Plains Creek person, I really feel that uh, 
our traditional knowledge and our understandings and our worldview and how we operate is very much at odds sometimes with the medical model, which is what autism really evolves into. And so really thinking about wanting to challenge that and challenge the status quo a bit. And so through extensive community engagements, you know, I've had hundreds of conversations just in my community and probably upwards of a thousand now since I started my PhD right across Canada of just people all really interested in the area of autism. And so autism has become obviously my passion, being a father, being a community member. Um, this study really is going to explore traditional understandings of autism and how we would have viewed it pre-contact and so on and, so, and how it's historically how it's evolved. And there's a few words actually that I found. So how is this First Nation, which is a, a First Nation just, uh, I believe it's east of Regina. They did this amazing community report that really looked at Plains Cree understandings of autism. And what they found is that what they, how they were defining it is a word, a wiskawit, and that really translates as, you know, given a spiritual intelligence. And I really feel that, you know, when I'm, when I'm, I'm working with my family and my, my parents and the families in the community, that's really what's happening. And autistic people would have been seen as gifted in my community. And I'm sure it's very much the same in the Six Nations. And that's one of the things I would love to explore with the community. So that's the second study. So the third study is where I think the most potential is to have impact in the community. So the third study is going to be in both communities. So the first two studies are going to be specific to my community. But then the third one is going to be me working with parents and caregivers and people who all have family who may or may not be suspected autistic or autistic people, as well as working with the child and youth and health team uh, in the Six Nations and really wanting to explore those same experiences right across both communities. I think there's a lot of similarities, but um, the more I think I do this research and the more I'm learning and the more I'm able to really try and grasp what's the realities of autism in, in our communities, there are some differences as well that are I think are really important. And so just thinking about you know, those three studies, the fourth part of my research, which is actually something that doesn't happen very often, is me wanting to give back. I think that research in of itself is very extractive and can be very harmful to our communities. And I, and I really appreciate the process of having a community ethics, and it's something that I'm going to have to look for in my own community because we don't have this. And so really, I, I understand you know, how protective we are of our communities and our families, and I, I, can, really, I can really appreciate that. But this study is going to be me working with um, families and just getting their experiences of, you know, the challenges in their communities. It could be diagnostic, it could be getting services and supports, it could be something that I'm not even thinking about. And so really wanting to unpack that with the families, but also looking at what works. You know, there's, there's families in our communities that are doing absolutely amazing, despite all the challenges that colonialism has brought to us, despite, you know, a lot of the dysfunction, unfortunately, that our communities face. And what allows them to do that as well? How do we learn from that? And how, would, how do we turn those lessons into good policy and, and good services and supports for our families? And so, I, I, so what, the one thing kind of layering all of this is not only me being from the community, but also I often take a very much a strength-based approach. And what I mean by that is that while, you know, there are a lot of deficits, a lot of negatives, a lot of dysfunction in our communities, my, my objective isn't to reinforce those, but rather explore what, what are the good things happening in our communities. And so for me, uh, Muscatrice is actually pretty notorious. Um, we're, we're in the news a lot for a lot of different negative things. And that's not the narrative that I want to show. I know that there's, there's beautiful things that are happening in our communities. You know, we're a community of ceremony and language and all these different things. And I'm sure it's the same with your community. And that's exactly the narrative I want to bring out. Those are the stories I would love to share. And so thinking about my methods and things like that, I'm going to be using something called Indigenous Story Work. So really allowing families to bring their stories to me, not as a researcher, but as more of as, as a parent, as somebody who's trying to connect with people. And then being able to take those stories and share them more abroad so that other First Nations can learn from what our communities are doing as well. And that's pretty much the gist of it. I won't take too much of your time. I want to thank you all for, for, for allowing me to ramble on here for a minute. Um, of course, if you have any questions, I'd love to you know explore this further. Okay, now so much, uh, Grant. I think it's uh, uh, really, uh, I think it's needed uh, for the work that you're doing, uh, especially with the, uh, you know, the types of supports that we can uh, that we can look to and give or rather even maybe the gaps and challenges within supporting um families uh, you know with autistic children and so forth 
Um, so I'm going to open the floor up at this point for any questions, comments for Grant. I see Greg has his hand raised. Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, Grant. Uh, thank you for that uh, bit of information. It sounds uh, sounds exciting, too, to get involved in something like that. Uh, my question was uh, just from your um, now from your previous knowledge and your previous research, you're going to probably provide certain data that will moving forward will either look at is answer questions like is autism on the rise or is it not being diagnosed or is there a lack of in terms of uh, treatment and, 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 and compare that to indigenous uh, communities as compared to off the res. Um, will that all that information be available to uh, to us as well? Yeah, so that is a very fair question. I get it quite a bit. It's like, what's the prevalence of autism in First Nations communities? I get that asked at every conference I go to, all these different engagements with, you know, outsiders and non-Indigenous people. And I I do not know. We don't have that kind of data, unfortunately. And the data do, we, we do have, to me, isn't good enough to be able to do like a, a really rigorous research study out of. But at the same time, my PhD research, I think, is really going to lay the foundation for me be, for me to be able to get to those kind of questions. So my background is quantitative. Um, these studies that I'm going to be doing are qualitative. So they're going to be very much just stories and, and things of that in the community. And so I'm hoping to learn about what are the gaps here. And then from there, I'll be able to maybe develop a prevalent study for both communities. And so I, I see this really as just the first step. And an opportunity, I think, for our communities to build some sort of, you know, a relationship together, even if it is at the intersections of autism, because I think that when I take the learnings from my community, I bring them to other communities, there's, there, there's an opportunity for that shared learning. And so if I were to say my opinion, this is just my opinion, so don't, don't take it as fact, um, autism rates are higher in our communities. And I have no idea why, and it's something that I really want to learn more about, so that maybe we can start to um, develop those those therapy plans and and support our children better because right now what's happening in my community is the government weaponizes the lack of data against us so for example the province doesn't want to come into our community because our relationship is supposed to be federal and on top of that they say well where's your evidence and what kind of evidence are you bringing to the table and if you don't have anything they're not going to listen to you and so again I'm hoping that this really just is an, it's more of an exploratory study. And then from here, we can start to, I can start to on my end as a, cause I'm gonna be a professor, I think sooner rather than later, I can start getting my own research dollars and I can start bringing those research dollars to the communities I work with. And we can start learning about the data, you know, the hard numbers and things like that. Follow up chief. Uh, yeah, I, I agree uh, Grant, cause you need a baseline, right? You need baseline, baseline data. And then you can uh, actually grow your research actually from there, you know. So good. Mm -hmm. I wish you I wish you luck and uh, and thanks for for what you do. Okay, Nyawa for that. Uh, Greg, are there any further questions or comments for Grant? Over to you. Oh, sorry. Maybe Michelle's looking to move. Not sure. Oh, I see Helen's got her hand raised. Sorry. No, I just wanted to comment that um, autism hasn't been that long in our community. Um, I don't know whether years passed and it wasn't diagnosed, whether people had autism and it wasn't diagnosed as such, but it's only been probably the last 15 years or 20 years where it's starting to get noticed and there's more and more kids been diagnosed with autism now. So I don't know if that's how it is in other communities, but I know that seems to be the way it is in Six Nations. Like, you know, when I was growing up, we never heard of autism. But like I said, I think maybe it just wasn't getting diagnosed in our community for all those years that it could be. It was maybe it was called something different. I don't know, but just, we're starting to hear a lot. Yeah, I'm 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 hearing the same thing in my community. So when I when I go talk to elders about this, people who have you know been living in the community for 70, 80 years, they say they tell me all the time like autism, how it presents is different than what it would have been back then. And 
those are the kind of, I guess, questions I would have. You know, where is that coming from? Is it, are we just getting better at detecting it, right? Are we getting better at noticing it? Um, again, when I'm looking at the strength-based approach I'm using, one thing I, I absolutely love about our communities is we're very accepting, actually. You know, you, you know, I hear parents all the time tell me, I don't need a diagnosis. I'm going to love my child no matter what. And then I explain to them, you, need, you do need a diagnosis so you can access the funding dollars that come with it. And they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And so that acceptance part, I think, is something that is so powerful. And it's something I think our communities have been doing for generations and generations. And I think that's a part of it as well. Okay, thank you now for that uh, as well, uh, Grant. Are there any further questions or comments? And if not, looking to a mover and seconder to approve a grant's uh, application for ethics. Moved by Nathan, seconded by Michelle. Are there any further questions or comments? Um, I just have one more comment. So I did get to come up to visit your community in March. Sure. And your child and youth health team is amazing, by the way. And uh, I, I really feel like your community has the right pieces in place to make, to do have impact with families. Well, now so much for that grant. I do appreciate uh, those comments and we'll, uh, we'll definitely, it's nice to hear those comments because we're, a lot of the times council always hears the bad and ugly and there's a lot of good happening. And so really appreciate those comments uh, and we'll definitely lay them on to the team. So now for that. Okay, that being said, it's been moved and seconded to approve a grants uh, ethics application. I'm gonna go to the vote, all in favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing a motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. Moved by Nathan, seconded by Michelle. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing a motion is carried. Well, Nyawa, so much, uh, Grant, for joining us uh, this evening and wish you all the best uh, in your work. Uh, and again, do appreciate even yourself and the work that you do. So, Nyawa, for that. Hi, Ms. Guptawin. Thank you. Take care. Have a great evening. Okay, Council, we are going to continue on with our agenda here. The next item on the agenda is the adoption of the General Council Minutes of May 23rd. Looking to see if there's any questions or comments in relation to the minutes, and if not, a mover seconder to adopt uh, the minutes. I see Nathan's hand hand raised. Um, was that to move, Nate? Oh, yeah. Okay, moved by Nathan to adopt our minutes, seconded by Greg. Are there any further questions or comments? It's seeing or hearing none. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing a motion is carried. Uh, we're going to continue again going along our agenda here. A council reports, I think the meetings attended, uh, we've updated already. Uh, there'll be further follow up on, on any other meetings that councillors are attending or meeting, yeah, that they're attending. Um, and I know there was a lengthy meeting yesterday, so there's probably lots uh, said there at political liaison. So that'll lead us into our next uh, item, which is updates from the office of the CEO with uh, Darren Jamison uh, and having a PowerPoint uh, presentation. So I'll pass the floor uh, over to yourself, uh, Darren. Yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, community. Um, and recognizing, Chief, that the, the, the presentation was just delivered to council just yesterday. Um, it was actually ready on Sunday, but it wasn't delivered until yesterday um, or late Sunday evening. So I think maybe what I'll do is uh, go through it very, very quickly for the benefit of community. I think there's some uh, important updates that community needs to hear just in terms of what's happening with administration at Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council. A or annual general assembly. Um, we had a really good discussion about that um, yesterday at political liaison, just in terms of preparing for that. Um, and that we will be having uh, additional uh, information that's provided to community in upcoming meetings leading up to the August date. I think it's on the agenda as, as set for August the 22nd. 
but I think we're going to move that possibly, uh, Chief, to the 24th or 25th as uh, there's a conference that, that I think that we're looking to attend. So we're looking at that week. Uh, that will be confirmed very soon. Um, so maybe what I'll do uh, just really quickly for benefit of community is I'll share my screen and go through some of the slides related to the update. Uh, there's a lot of slides here. There's 22 in all, so I'm not going to go through it all. I think it's important that community see that all of the work that's been happening. Um, so essentially, we had a, a SAT retreat where we came together and we talked about a lot of the changes. And really what we're looking at doing is repositioning the organization uh, to be more responsive and more practical in terms of efficiencies and making decisions that are more based in data. Uh, and I think that's part of uh, coming up with a, a statement that, that we can speak to that it really is, is related to our, our values and upholding our, our values as Haudenosaunee people, our inherent rights and responsibilities, and a respectful and collaborative environment. And I think that's something that certainly the organization uh, has been, um, in some respects, siloed uh, in the past. And these changes are really meant to, to help to strengthen uh, the organization. I, I liken it to the trunk of a tree um, and we're building the core uh, a lot stronger to be able to do planning into the future. And I just wanna pause on this one point in that one of the key elements for the AGA will be to provide the longer term plans that we have developed uh, through this term of council um, to really demonstrate. And it's really rooted in not just programs and services, but infrastructure. We have a huge infra infrastructure gap here um, it's about 1.6 billion and that's just the bricks and mortar. That's the roads, that's the water mains, et cetera. And we have some plans uh, as part of this update where we would advance uh, to look at housing, uh, the backlog in housing as well. And all of those issues uh, we can advance through some creative financing through the Canada Infrastructure Bank at very low interest at 1% interest as an example to really advance that. And we can see foresee by the year 2026 that everyone in the community will have water, access to, to water main, very clean water. And that is a huge issue within the community, as well as looking at the housing issues that we, we face. So we're looking at doing all of those changes. Um, one of the other key, key things that we, we're looking at rolling out right now, and it's actually, uh, there's a decision point uh, in tonight, tonight's meeting, is we've completed a compensation view for our employees. Um, finally, it's taken some time, but we've finally done it. And we wanna raise our, our, our wages up to market, market levels so we're, we're competitive. Uh, and that's important for retaining and, and attracting uh, talent to the community, our own members and making sure that they're paid appropriately. And so we're looking at implementing th those changes as well. And, we, and the important thing is we've planned for this. We put, a, we put a beside a, re a reserve continuity to make sure that we can cover the cost of that. Uh, and we have some surpluses from the previous year that can go towards that. So we can talk about that. It's in a decision point in the next session of council uh, in the in-camera session. So we'll, we'll get to that later. But I think it's an important point to talk about uh, just for not only for our staff, but for community to hear that because our, our, our staff live in the community, they have families in the community. And I think that that's a really positive uh, thing that's happening. Uh, we're looking at a lot of restructuring and most of it is modifying our roles. Nothing really that's really substantive. An example would be the health, the health services department. And this is in alignment with our community plan that was done in 2019, really just rebranding it to a well-being uh, framework and, and really repositioning. And we've taken a really critical uh, look at our portfolio system and seeing whether it's working or not within the health sector. And we've decided and, and determined that it, it really hasn't been as effective as we would like. Um, because they were on a pathway to be more of an authority, a separate authority, and we're pulling that back into more of a community-based framework for health. Uh, so we're looking at it from a well-being lens. So we're looking at recruiting uh, for that role and, and other roles uh, that are tied to that. So I just, I'm not going to get into all the detail here because there's a lot of detail, but just to show that there's a lot of change happening. There's a lot of opportunities for for community members, uh, and I encourage not only our, our existing staff to look at these but people who don't work for us to look at these opportunities uh, that are coming up in the near future. Uh, and also, Chief, you know, we've talked about this at our check-ins regularly about supporting uh, political advocacy better. We've had a lot of situations where we, for, to be frank, we haven't really been prepared in integrating and preparing position papers, not just from a technical lens, but what is the impact in community? 
Um, so that's the other uh, ability that we have with some of the structural changes that we make to help facilitate that better, uh, more of a team approach. Uh, so if there's an issue or a specific um, motion that's gonna be brought uh, that we need to look at or uh, consider um, that like say for instance, health transfer transformation or ind uh, indigenous-based distinction-based health legislation that's coming down the pipeline, we're able to inform a decision or a position paper on that. Uh, that's uh, technically informed from all of our, our levels within within health services. So th those are all the key key pieces that we're looking to shift and reposition the organization to be stronger. So in support of political advocacy, we don't have enough resources uh, to run under the current funding arrangements that we do have. Uh, and we're all do we're doing all of this really in anticipation of the, of the court case that's upcoming with litigation. Uh, with the thing, you know, we we uh, have a number of meetings with think tanks, bringing in experts not just from our directors, but also from other community agencies in the community, to really think through what is it that we really need, and how do we what what is the sort of settlement that we need, um, and if the if the province and the feds come down, come to us and say uh, we want to have a pre-trial settlement with and offer something to the Six Nations, we got to have a process to vet that, much like Jacqueline was talking about earlier, uh, Jacqueline House about. Well, how is what what is a barometer what is sort of our what will we not accept uh so this is a technical team uh, that would would bring a briefs back to council to consider based on those priorities that we've set um, again this goes back to the long-term planning so again back to the aga concept of having uh we want to have mapping i'd like to have a 3d diagram of the community that shows the future state of the community based on the plans that we put in place for the next 10 years uh, again, they're not set in stone, but there are certainly things that we can do uh, based on our current financial position moving forward and supported uh, by the litigation and those resources that are coming. So we're really just planning to be able to, to say this is where we can invest the funds and utilize other financing that's available to us that is really self-funding. Really self it's really not something that we're taking funds from our, our resources, but we're levering funds from outside sources. Um, we're talking, we talked about this at length yesterday about the, the AGA, but also the walk the track event. Uh, we socialized this with council yesterday as well uh, and the community, just in terms of uh, uh, TAP resources assisting us with this, this event in September. Uh, we're looking at probably the second or third week of September to have um, an, a series of staged events along the track uh, to raise awareness and education about the history the true history of the Haldeman Tract and what does it mean? Most people that live along the track don't even know. Uh, and it's important to, to build support and, and understanding that this is about a uh, breach of trust accounting. It's not about us taking land back from people or kicking them out of their homes. It's really like building support. And I think uh, many counselors have used the word friendship as a friendship walk to kind of build that around the case and, and really kind of put pressure on our court system to really look at that. Uh, and, and, and appeal to the sense of, of the, the Canadian uh, public, not just in, in this area, but the entire country uh, that we are in the right here. So all of that um, and the AGA really would, would help to kind of promote that event um, and looking at around, I guess I got August 24th listed here for placeholders for the AGA, but that's yet to be confirmed. So I think it's an important one to kind of put on the radar and, and what we hope to deliver there. And we wanna make it a fun event. We wanna have food, we wanna have entertainment, and it's really an opportunity for, for families, to people to connect, those that live here and obviously those that don't, to come back to community and reconnect. Uh, the election code committee is another one. Uh, we have finally <laughs> a viable application in place for a CEPO. That's been a bit of a, a barrier. Um, I believe that that will be brought to council as a recommendation for appointment, uh, if not the next council meeting, the following council meeting. Uh, so it still puts us in good position timeline in a timely way to be able to work through any kind of election code uh, amendments uh, and, uh, and survey and approval, but also to uh, prepare for the upcoming election. So that should be all sorted out before the end of July. Uh, we're looking at more space. We have a big space issue here in the community. And the, these are really key elements that we've been looking at. Uh, Six Nations Polytechnic has some space in their, in their West Building at the Eldon ca campus. So we're looking at taking over some of that space uh, and working with them as one of our community agency partners uh, to help our needs in the short term, as well as the fill in the second floor and at a third level at White Pines uh, to really kind of round out 
the health services uh, and now the well-being department in terms of their needs for space. The other one is uh, we want to build a commercial space at Oneida Business Park uh, as part of our DevCorp 2.0 um, uh, agreement. Uh, we have given back a lot of the land up there, over 100 acres. We have a lot of scope to put in not only um, office space, but commercial space. Uh, we, we have some feasibility work that's ongoing, as Council knows, related to that. And I think it's there's a lot of opportunity in that, in that zone. Um, the other one is obviously we've talked at length about an archival library records building. We have a design for that. We have a location on Herald Road, which already has the infrastructure available to support it. Uh, it's just a question of getting the financing and getting that rolling as well. Uh, we have an issue with the fire that we were fighting. Um, we have uh, uh, the legal team is going to come in to give an update to council. Uh, I believe we're targeting either the 11th, I think it's July 11th, the next general council meeting in July uh, to provide an update on that. So we have uh, our witnesses ready to go on that one. I'm not going to get into too much detail about that because obviously it's something that's ongoing. Uh, we have uh, set aside. So we have a process with our infrastructure task force on looking at best use of our lands. As everyone knows, they're diminishing. And really, it's just a way of what is it that different facilities need, whether it's housing, whether it's commercial development, what sort of um, services do they need? If it's three phase power or is it single phase? In, in which case, our current state of our infrastructure, what is the zones for those? And that's where when we look at new projects coming on board, that's where we, where we put them into the mapping. Uh, we work very closely with lands and membership uh, with our GIS mapping. And that, that's some of the information we want to share with community is like it's, it is a plan, but it's also a tool. It's a very powerful tool. It allows us to, to, to be flexible. It allows us to make changes if other needs come up that, are, that become prioritized. Uh, because our land is diminishing, as everyone knows. Uh, so that's an important um, piece that we had, didn't really have in the past in terms of how do we do diligence around set asides. Uh, HR matters, we have those ongoing. Um, this speaks to some issues with palliative care. We have done follow-up uh, relative to this discussion at a previous council meeting in terms of those directives. And uh, we are looking at filling out the, the palliative nursing complement with those folks that were that had brought, brought concerns to council, as well as issuing letters of concern with staff who did not perform well in that situation. And as I mentioned before, we're looking at restructuring the health, the health portfolio system to be more responsive uh, and to make sure that these issues don't arise into the future. That was already in, in, in the works, um, but I understand it. And, you know, these things, people get frustrated and time goes on and, and it's, it is, it is un, un, unacceptable when it takes this long, but luckily we're on the right path. Uh, just some, some other points. This is more for council, uh, just in terms of the CFO re, being role being discontinued. I think that there's probably uh, a good scope to look at reinstating the role uh, with it after the new election. Uh, Jennifer and Wayne are doing an excellent job. Um, and really committed to their jobs. And, and I think they're doing an excellent job at this point. In fact, one of them will probably look at uh, applying for that role in, in the new year. Um, as well as the OGD investigation is ongoing. Um, I've asked for an update from our lead investigator on a timeline. I don't have clarity on the timeline, but I'm pushing them. And uh, I expect there's a, there's a number of interviews that are continuing there. And hopefully that'll be wrapped up within the next month or so. Uh, these next few slides, I'm just going to quickly go through. They're there for your information uh, in, in the PowerPoint presentation, and, and I know it's getting late. Um, these are, uh, I've asked for, uh, you know, these are the executive director roles within the CEO's office. So this would be Trevor, Trevor Bombery's role on nation building. He's done extensive work with consultation and he works with the CAP team. He, he was involved with the caucus, as everyone knows. He's very, very been in terms of his past work experience as well. So he's had a lot, he brings a lot of that to, to bear in his role in, on the nation building side uh, and building and restoring relations as well with our, with our Iroquois brothers and sisters. Uh, he's done a lot of work with the community engagement standards, which we heard an update about very strong in terms of a guide. And you know, what is the threshold when we have engagement based on the importance of the, of the issues that are, that are happening? So he's involved with that. Uh, in that committee as well, uh, the J Treaty Border Alliance, a whole number of issues here. In terms of those issues there, um, lands and membership, a lot of his stuff is to do with lands, uh, as well as uh, tourism is, is another area. It's gonna keep rolling through because there's a lot here. Um, 
Uh, Councillor Fraser talked about tourism with City of Niagara Falls, and in fact, he's Jackie Jamison and himself. Uh, we're working with him on that as well, so that's good. Uh, Friendship Center, uh, Hamilton Friendship Agreement, uh, and getting back to those, you know, the, the need for those tripartite, tri, tri municipal uh, county meetings again, uh, he would definitely be instrumental in those as well. Planning performance evaluation, this is Zach, Zach Miller's role. Again, uh, looking to bring some of the roles that were previously held under the health department uh, under Zach for more for a data informed and data, data analytics uh, to look at what is the, the community impacts, like much like we've heard uh, from, our, from our delegation just now on, on autism. Uh, what are those impacts? Um, yes, it's health related, but it's all related to well being across the board and all across all departments and how they work together and more collaboratively. So this is meant to help inform that and, and those plans going forward. Um, so he's working on moving some of those roles under him to kind of, um, and, and, and all funding comes with it. It's not like we're eliminating roles, we're just moving them over uh, to be more of a wider scope and not just sort of focusing on health and health planning. So there's, there's more about that. I'm not gonna get into all the details. There's a lot of detail here. You can read that. And if you have questions, also certainly you can, you can ask me the questions at any time related to this update. It's, there's a lot more in this update than the previous one. Uh, I think as because we're really trying to ramp up for the AGA up, up and coming, um, as well as uh, a number of other uh, activities that we, that we didn't have before. Uh, service excellence is the role that Holly Smith uh, has uh, and really looking at improving our services to community. And there's a lot of uh, elements here uh, you can see some of the departments that, that she's working very closely with. Um, and we're looking at, again, uh, recruiting for that well-being, director of well-being very shortly. And I don't think uh, just in terms of the other updates in, in regards to this, I think I'll just leave it for now. Chief, I know it's a lot, a lot of information, um, but I think, you know, based on, you know, council's request for additional updates, we wanted to make this a bit more fulsome. And I think really all, really all it is is, is preparing and be able to report to community just in terms of what as as the, this term of council and, and the staff what have we done how will we reposition the organization to be more responsive and looking at more long-term planning as opposed to just reacting to other agendas other legislation that's being forced upon us and other first nations uh, to be able to be in a better and stronger position going forward so that's really a lot of it, what we're doing and the big piece is, as well is really um, the infrastructure gap. It's between, it was 1.6 billion, but with inflation and everybody knows costs are going up, it's definitely approaching $2 billion. We have this huge infrastructure gap in this community that we need to address. And without that being addressed, it's really difficult to build a quality of life for people. So I'll just pause right there, Chief. And uh, uh, I guess there could be some questions, but maybe we can look at maybe having some questions in, in, in the in-camera session as well. But I just wanted to provide those high-level uh, updates for Chief and Council, as well as community for those that are online. Okay, now so much, uh, Darren, as you can uh, see, uh, community, there's a lot of work happening uh, 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 at the CEO's office, and I think it's important, uh, and as well to Darren's point, uh, to keep community updated in, in, in along with uh, with what the plans are I think it's actually it's exciting work to be honest as well uh, and I think it's something that is again uh, you know when you can at least have uh, you know finally have a position of a 10-year you know financial plan and infrastructure plan uh, you know that's it's set it's really setting the stage so do appreciate uh, the work uh, Darren uh, from yourself and your team I think it again just goes to uh, to show that you know, as the largest nation, you know, it's we're, we still have our challenges, right? And we're still uh, working through those challenges and what it looks like. And so uh, I think it's, a, again, a nice to see, and and for community's sake, again, the, the plans of, of what we have and, and how we uh, make sure we're informing community of them. So do appreciate uh, that uh, presentation. Darren, I'm going to look to see if there's any questions or comments Again, it's really a uh, really wholesome uh, plan. Like Darren said, a lot of information. Um, so if there's anything further as well, please uh, do uh, reach out to Darren. Uh, Helen, I see has, has her hand raised. Yeah, I 
I think it's a thorough uh, information session. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm I'm just questioning um, if we're going to get a report from Joe. I can't I can't say the name of his program, <laughs> but if we're going to get a a report from Joe regarding the different kinds of issues and concerns and complaints, whatever that the community raises to him. I think it's important for us to know what those are as council so we know what you know what's going on in the community. The other one was um we we had this excellent presentation on surveys yesterday um with a concept of doing our own survey system and I just wondered how where something like that might fit into the long-term plan would that be part of infrastructure or that because i really would like call to see council get going on that i think it's a really excellent idea to try and develop our own survey system as it was yeah. presented yesterday i just wished all the councils could have heard it but it was a really good uh, presentation so where would something like that fit into the long-term or short-term planning yeah i think Thanks, thanks, Helen. I, I agree 100% that the community engagement standards and survey guide, uh, the guide that relates, I think that the really good piece around that work was the guide and how do you apply it and how do you determine yeah. the level of engagement that's needed depending on what it is. So we talk about long-term plan. I think the whole idea here is to really set up the next term of council to have a plan to work to work with. And I think it is, it's something that's not etched in stone it's it's a it's a model of a plan and it, the thing of it is is we we did it in a way that we we created a tool to be able to adapt or modify or change as things shift i think that's the key piece of it so those those elements as a tool um certainly there's a, there's room and the aga is a big piece of the step in that we would be to, to provide elements of it leading up to the AG, aga but then to present this is what we have as an offering for the next council to then implement. Um, but in terms of the CES or the community engagement standards, I think there's a role for that there, absolutely. And also things like if we're making changes to residency bylaw, um, that's that's how we 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 put it through the process um, uh, to get to a place of, you know, INAC rules as a referendum. Well, that, the the community engagement standards is not a referendum. It has a level of engagement that's based on the level of sensitivity and importance it is to our community. Um, so that's an important one. And we just had a meeting about that actually this week uh, about those changes or proposed changes to residency and how we can improve upon that. And what is the process to follow? Uh, and it would be to put it through the, the CES and using the guide to help us navigate that. So I appreciate the comment and I totally, totally agree uh, that we that we take that approach. I think you had another question at the beginning. Sure. Yeah, Joe. Oh, Joe. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you. Uh, actually, Joe just submitted his yearly report. He's been here with us a year, uh, believe it or not. Um, he's had, I believe it's around 175 complaints that he's processed. So there is a report that was just delivered last week. So we can we can certainly have him come to council and, and give a presentation. Okay. And uh, as for the, the election, election, uh, What's it called? EPO? CPO. 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 Election officer. We have hired uh, an election officer that wasn't from Six Nations. We did that before. I don't know if it says in the election code they have to be a Six Nations band member. I didn't think it did. But we did hire a guy from someplace else before to do the election code. So just let you know that. I mean, to do the elections, not the election code. Right. Okay, uh, now uh, for uh, those uh, questions, Helen, and your responses, Darren, I have uh, Sherry Lincoln has her hand raised. Um, yes, thank you for the, um, the update. And um, hopefully this will be an ongoing thing to bring the community along with us, just to keep them updated because I think it's great information, Darren, and thank you for all the, the follow-ups, but also um, bringing the community along with us in a lot of these transformations. So thank you. 
Okinawa for that, uh, Sherry Lynn. Uh, looking uh, to see if there's any further questions or comments. I think just really quickly as well, um, uh, Darren is on the Joe on Joe's report. You know, it's it's. I don't think it's necessarily just hearing you know the complaints as well because uh, there's a lot of good things that Joe has heard from my understanding as well uh, in in some of the processes that are currently in place. Uh, you know, not basically not everything is broken. You know, there's things that, that are working and there's things that, you know, we are looking uh, for better efficiencies of where they're, they are not working. And so that's part of, again, uh, the ongoing work, uh, you know, of Darren and his team and so forth. So do appreciate that and, and actually look forward uh, to uh, and, and for community's sake uh, for for them to hear from Joel and, and the the. Um, the types of complaints that come through and as well as the action of follow up to those complaints. So just wanted to, to comment on that. No, I, I really appreciate that. And, and it's it's a model that other communities are looking at. Like Six Nations has done this and, you know, we should do something similar. I think it, it's done a, few, a lot of things. It's um, there are positive outcomes, positive feedback, but also positive outcomes. And so there's been some impacts to, to programming based on you know, how he's working to resolve the issues that come forward. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of positives coming from it. Um, I mean, that was the purpose of it was to make improvements. That's everything that we do is trying to make improvements. Totally agree. And I think uh, really it's, um, it's been beneficial as well because I know there was some, you know, I guess a little bit of clarification because it's, it's, it was never for counselors community is still counselors are always still open obviously to 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 me and any of our members and so what i see joe as as part of really helping us you know helping us vet through some of these complaints and in directing people of who to contact and or who's not you know picking up the phone or type of so i think it's really uh it's it's been beneficial to council as a whole uh, because of the fact of we need the we need the help, <laughs> uh, and I think it's just uh, it's something that again is just another avenue for community to be able to share concerns and as well as in input and feedback. So do do appreciate that. Are there any further questions or comments for Darren's uh, update? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands being raised at this time. So I will look uh, to a motion uh, to accept Darren's uh, Office of the CEO update as information at this time. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Michelle, seconder. Seconded by Nathan. Any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. Well, now, uh, Darren, for the for that update, and do look forward to uh, again um, as we uh, as we move move forward on some of these these bigger pieces. Okay, council, and as under scheduling, so we're we'll get the uh, the AGA. So that's for communities information as well. We are planning to have. Uh, an annual gen general assembly. Uh, we want to have as many members come on out and to see the plans that we have uh, for the next five to 10 years. You know, our whole goal is to set up the next council for success, whether that be through orientation packages so that everybody knows what has occurred during this term, kind of where we've been in the past, where we plan to go in the future. Uh, so the, we'll get that date confirmed. It will be the week of the 22nd in August. So looking uh, most likely around the 24th or 25th uh, to have our AGA for community. And again, the whole goal is to have uh, in the past, and I'm glad that we've, I'm sure you discussed this yesterday, uh, you know, in the past, the AGA have kind of always been, um, I guess, not the best experience, I think, for community members, because it, it would turn into, I think, sometimes some negative um, outlooks. Whereas this this AGA is what we're trying to do is engage more with community. Obviously, we engage better with food, <laughs> having food and entertainment and having that be a part of the event, I think is going to be a whole game changer in terms of really setting the stage of 
what is uh, what is it that council is doing uh, and what the plans look like for the future. So looking forward to that event. That does complete our agenda for the general council open por portion. Oh, sorry, Helen. Do you want to make a comment under community safety? Sure. Uh, it's been requested um, to ask council if we can put one of those um, speed things on Chasewood Road. You know, those where the, the, the light flickers how fast you're going or how slow you're going on Chasewood Road. Okay, so uh, what we can... I don't know who looks after that. I think it might be Mike, but... And put one in front of my house if you want, because uh, okay. as we know, some some guy on a scooter or whatever he was riding got hit, um, and people are com really really complaining about the speeding on Chiefswood Road. And we've never had one of those traffic things on Chiefswood before. I know they've had them on Fourth Line, but they've never had it on Chiefswood, and I think we re we really need one. Probably not too far from the bridge. They really come flying around that that curve there, and then they fly up the hill. And so <laughs> I've been asked if council can do that. Okay, so what we'll do is, uh, if I could get uh, Darren, if you could just note that to maybe do some follow up with uh, with Mike at Public Works. I think um, as well as uh, the police did have. I recall the one on Force Line, and that I think was from the police at that time um, that had put that one up there. So I'm not sure if maybe that's even a, a connector uh, if we need may need assistance from um, uh, the police as well. So Darren, uh, we can work on that request, Helen, and we'll do some follow up. Okay, is there, uh, that being said, that does complete our agenda for this evening's general council meeting. So at this point in time, I will look to a motion to adjourn. Moved by Michelle, seconded by Nathan. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Thank you, Nyawa, to everybody for joining our council meeting uh, this evening. I hope everybody has a, a great evening and again, a great start to your day tomorrow. Take care.